Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Network Saturday, August 25th, 2018. This is episode 1517. Enjoy. The Tech Guy podcast is brought to you by Qualcomm Snapdragon. According to Ookla, Android smartphones with Snapdragon 845 from Qualcomm had faster data speeds on AT&T and T-Mobile than non-Android phones with Intel modems. Based on over a million real-world tests, Done in Q2 2018. See all the data for yourself at qualcom.com slash twit. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater. You know how we do it. Digital photography, smartphones, smartwatches, technology, and all its wonderful array. 8888-ASK-LEO. The phone number if you want to talk about tech you want answers to your questions <laughs> if you if you uh if you don't have any questions you just want to say something that's okay too 888-827-5536 that's toll free from anywhere in the u.s or uh, canada that's the phone number 8888 ask leo outside that area you know the rest of the world all the other 188 whatever it is countries you could just use skype out and call because it's a toll-free number 8888 ask Leo. Little net neutrality uh, battle going on <laughs> right now. The uh, the folks at Verizon uh, severely throttled the Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District broadband service. Uh, the folks in Santa Clara County, as has as happens in uh, California, had gone up to Mendocino hundred some miles uh, north to help fight that massive uh, fire that's still going on. Uh, they used the uh, Verizon broadband service to provide crisis response, emergency services. But there was a little, um, <laughs> little hitch in the get along and Verizon had slowed them down to dial up speeds. The uh, fire department uh, battled since December 2017, and then in a series of increasingly desperate emails this June and July, the F FPD battled with Verizon, begging them to cease the throttling and warning the company of potential harm to public safety during major emergencies and disasters. Verizon said, well, we could do that, but uh, you will have to pay double, more than double. And then they, uh, then they ended it. Verizon says this was merely a customer service mistake. And the situation has nothing to do with net neutrality or the current proceeding in court. Well, yeah, except if the phone companies were, the broadband companies were still regulated like phone companies, the FCC would have stepped in and said, yeah, knock it off. But now they're not, thanks to the FCC's change in the rules. In fact, it's the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, that now is in charge of enforcing this. They don't have really an enforcement arm, so maybe we'll see you in court in a couple of years. Meanwhile, the fire burns. Speaking of fires, T-Mobile now says 2 million customers, well, 3% of their 77 million customers, so I guess that's 2.5 million customers, uh, information has been leaked to hackers, billing, zip codes, phone numbers, email addresses, and account numbers. Uh, no, hey, no financial data, no uh, social security numbers, no passwords. So nothing to worry about here. And then uh, researchers, I guess, have discovered another bug. <laughs> if you buy something in the Apple store, you can then uh, guess people's T-Mobile PIN <laughs> I don't know. With the account number in the pin, it seems like there's a lot of damage could be done there. Might be worth changing your T-Mobile pin and password. Hmm, let's see. <laughs> Here's an interesting uh, story that comes actually from last spring, but we're only learning about it now because of a, a gag order. Earlier this year, 
a federal judge signed a search warrant for uh, authorities in Maine. They were trying to figure out, there were nine uh, robberies, and they're trying to figure out who did it. They thought, you know, we could go to Google and just see where everybody, who everybody was in the, that was in the vicinity of this these robbers, who they are, just like everybody who was around that area. Let's just get their information. What about that? Maybe that'll help us narrow it down. And a judge signed off on this, now, even though they didn't know if the suspect was even carrying a Google device. The warrant ordered Google to turn over. All data, whether a user was carrying an Android or iPhone, or, you know, because if you're running a Google app, Google knows where you are. Uh, they wanted everything, too. They wanted names, addresses, <laughs> phone numbers of everybody in that area. That's uh, that's what we, they call that a fishing expedition. We don't have any clues. So let's just let's just look at everybody who was in that area. Google uh, declined. This is back in April. Uh, they were ordered again. They declined again. Uh, eventually, uh, they the, the, amazingly enough, the police did actually find arrest a guy. Figured it out that he even without the Google information. There's a struggle going on between uh, corporations, especially corporations that know an awful lot about us these days, and law enforcement who think this is hey, this is a treasure trove. This is a this is a treasure trove of information. If we could only just see where everybody is at all times, my goodness, crime would be at an end. It's true. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's true. All right, I get it. I have to give you some good news. How about this? Microsoft bought Minecraft. You know Minecraft, right? If you if you know a kid under fifteen, you know Minecraft because it's all the rage. I guess it's even still today. Kids love Minecraft. They just love playing it. It's like the, it's Legos for the 21st century, even though it's all a online, you know, on a computer game. Uh, you're building bricks, blocks, and you can build stuff. You can, you can, you know, there's some. You can fight uh, ghoulies and goblins and stuff. There's, there's, you know, they call them mobs. There's stuff you can do, but also you, uh, you can dig, you can mine, you can fish, <laughs> you can build a house. It's a construction kit. It's really cool. Microsoft did some, I think, some really good things. You know, sometimes you worry when a big company buys a little company and a game that is much beloved that they might not cherish the game in the same way its users do. But Microsoft seems to have done a great job with Minecraft. In fact, they created an education edition of Minecraft, which is brilliant because if you want to catch the imaginations of middle schoolers, no better way than to put a pickaxe in their hand and say, let's dig. Uh, the education edition is teaching kids to program. It's teaching them chemistry. It's teaching them a lot of stuff. In fact, there's a chemistry resource pack that you can turn on now if you have what they call the bedrock edition, the pocket edition of Minecraft on the Xbox or on Windows. You could turn it on and do and do chemistry, real chemistry. You get the periodic table of elements. You combine elements. Things happen. What a cool idea. They've also put education edition on the iPad now. So this is a this is I think a great way to learn about STEM, science, technology, and math. And uh, the compound creator is so cool. Now I'll, I'll put a link to, in the show notes to the the because uh, it's not easy, you know it's a little complicated turning it on. You have to uh, you have to be using Windows 10, uh, PC or Xbox console. In the game, you have to go to create new world. Yeah, yeah, you have to create the world from scratch to do this. Under the and then look for cheats under the cheats menu. You toggle on education. That's a good cheat. Isn't that, they're even smart enough to say, "I know." <laughs> Let's put education under cheats. Then it'll look cool. And you can make helium, and you can craft balloons. You can make latex. Yeah, if you do helium, and then you make a latex, and then you make a balloon, and then they put the helium in the balloon. You can float. It's so cool. It's so cool. Good on you, Microsoft. That's awesome. Better chemistry through Minecraft. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. I'd love to hear from you if you want to talk high tech. That's what we do here. The world is a-changing. And uh, what does it all mean? That is the subject of the show. 8888-ASK-LEO, the phone number. Let's get some uh, 
calls on the line. Oh, we already do. Kim Sheffer's already here working hard. And we will take your calls next. Oh, yeah. Speaking of strange, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Here's Kim Schaffer. I'm not sure where you're going with that, but I'll take it. Speaking of odd. I hello, am, Kim. I'm odd. My chair is higher now. so now my You are. You're up in the air. Up. You're up in the air. What are you doing all the way up there? Uh, the ball got pumped up. <laughs> oh. John, have you pumped up my ball yet? Yours is good. He says mine's good, but yours was sagging. Oh, I thought mine was pretty uh, pretty pumped up last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm I could losing. use a little air in mine. I like it. Uh, I like it when it's really uh, people. We should, probably are wondering what that. <laughs> what are you talking about? We sit on. Um, we sit on bouncy balls. Bouncy balls. <laughs> That's good for your posture or something. Yeah, well, I could use all the help I could. Use. <laughs> I'm kind of a sloucher. I just do it because it's uh, uh, more active than just. Yeah, I'm a sloucher too, and I don't. Yeah. It's hard enough to keep my energy up. But, I don't uh, think I've ever sat I'm in tired. a real chair during the, doing doing this show in all the years. I don't think they're really. Yeah, I think it's always been a ball. Really? Yeah. And was that your choice, or did they subject you to that? Uh, no, because Heather was here and she, she had liked the ball. The ball. Okay, I, I good. Just, I adapted to the ball. The Very ball nice. Great. <laughs> yeah. Do you do you sit on one at home? No, I don't have. Yeah. I lay in bed at home. <laughs> yeah, that's what I do too. That's probably why you and I both <laughs> slouch. Slouch. You have the, Let the, <laughs> The laptop lean. <laughs> this is not the posture show, however. This Although, is not Dr. Dean Adele. there's something about uh, techies, probably because they spend a lot of time sitting, sitting at a at desk times. looking at a computer, that they're fascinated by ways to sit. And for a while, I don't know if you remember these weird crouching desks where you'd have your legs, you'd be kneeling, and you're, it, they were not comfortable. Well, there's the stand-up desks, and, and then there's now the there's treadmill desks. And then treadmill. That's <laughs> so. right. John has a treadmill desk. Oh, does he really? I believe so. I've we lost quite a bit that. of weight because of that. Yeah. Yeah. So I, there's something about uh, we geeks. We like we like to, uh, you know, I know what it is. We're never content with the way things are. We always want to hack it, change right. it, modify it. That's a good thing. I think that's one of the things that's made Silicon Valley what it is today. Never satisfied with the status quo. Well, all during last week, before getting ready for another show there was a guy in here with a headset yeah and he was just like telling the, the mouse was, to do things instead oh. of actually having it was yeah. for your screensaver yeah kind of he was I, was he the one i can't remember if that was the security robot no or... not the robot the uh <laughs> the other thing that was on we but, had a security robot yeah. patrolling the parking lot before the show last that week was funny you had people pulling into the parking lot to take pictures with it selfies yeah, with the robot it was pretty funny but no this guy was talking to this headset the whole time and just meaning like now he doesn't have a mouse or a keyboard nope. he was just talking to it get ready for the new world to do so yes techies like all their new gadgets do you i've gotten used to the idea at first it really puzzled me and bothered me that people would walk down the street like madmen talking briskly and vigorously to nothing, to the air. Oh, with their pods with their and Bluetooth, Bluetooth headphones. Bluetooth. Yes. That's... And now it's just commonplace. Yeah, oh, yeah, he's on the phone. Yeah. I When I'd look in a car and see somebody talking to themselves, I thought they were crazy. Yeah, and not now anymore. Now it's just normal. No. Nope. <laughs> They're on the phone. <laughs> Crazy's the new normal. Crazy. <laughs> we're talking to ghosts in our ear. Who should I, uh, speaking of talking to, who should I start the uh, show with? Oh. Uh, there's too much information here. I can't see it. Uh, George in Venice, Florida. Um, <laughs> Another thing I say all the time. There's too much there's information. Too much information. George in Venice, Florida. Let's go. All right. Him. Thank you, Kim. Hi, George. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. Long time listener and a three time caller. Well, that's not. I should give you a sticker. <laughs> Some little red gold okay, star I'm to not put on your forehead. Not a ball, but uh, I've got a question. I'm yes, pretty sir. sure you've got the answer to. Can't hear you on my phone, Leo. You can't hear me. No, hang on. So let me. Hello, check. hello. Can you can you hear me now? <laughs> can, hey, you, can you hear me on my phone? I hear you. I hear you, George. Can you hear me now, George? Okay, I can hear you. Now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Simple question. My iPhone gets uh, overloaded 
all the memory is gone. And so I have to delete some photos or apps. Yes. Right? Yes. So I go to my photos and I go to delete one. And it, what it says is it's going to delete. Everywhere. Everywhere. So don't do that. I don't want to do don't that. Don't do that. So there's a few choices you have. This is the most common problem on iPhones, on any phone. The things that fill it up, even if you got a 32-gig iPhone, you probably had plenty of room until you started taking lots of pictures. And nobody ever takes the pictures off. So there's two ways to do this. There's the Apple way and the Google way. And you get to pick. I prefer the Google way. But let me tell you the Apple way. Apple way might cost you a little bit of money. Apple has a thing called iCloud. And that's where the photos can be stored in full quality. If you turn on uh, the iCloud photo library, it'll store them up there. And it'll store them uh, in, as originals. And then, and then what you can do, you can do this, by the way, in the settings. If you go to photos, you, you then underneath iCloud photos, there's another setting that says optimize photo storage. If you select that, what it does is it deletes the full quality images that are on your phone because they're already in the cloud. They're safe and keeps basically thumbnails, phone sized, much smaller versions of those photos. So that will, by doing that, that will save space, but it may fill up your iCloud photo storage. The cloud is, of course, the internet. And if it does that, then you have to pay for more. And Apple, uh, you know, it's not expensive, but Apple does charge you. I think I pay a buck ninety-nine a month for 200 gigabytes something like that uh, so that's one issue one way to do it the other way to do it is use a program called google photos which is free from google uh, in in google's photo app you can have it back up all the photos the only drawback to this unlike apple's photo app the google photo app has to be open for it to back up so you need to periodically just open the google photos app and back up all your photos make sure that they're all backed up and and there's a little icon that you'll see when they're when they're not backed up and all that. So um, oh, this is that's the Apple Photos. Let me go to the Google Photos. I'm looking at my photos right now. So when it's all backed up, there'll be a little check mark next to the cloud. Then you can go into Settings uh, under Google Photos and say Free Up Space. Now this is backing up your photos, not the originals, but very close to original quality, to Google's cloud, which gives you free unlimited storage. So all of your photos will be backed up there. And then there's a button in there that says free up space, and it will find all the photos that are currently backed up. And you can delete those. And that generally will save you gigabytes of space. This costs you nothing. Google's photo sharing app means that all those photos are still visible. If you want to look at a photo, you just go through the photo sharing app, and you can click on the one you want to see. And you can see it full size. So it, it still exists on the Google Cloud, but it saves the images on your phone. There's a third way that you could do this if you didn't want to share photos to the cloud, which is to periodically connect it to a computer, copy the photos off, and then delete them. And when it says, you know, delete it everywhere, it won't delete backed up photos that are backed up in iTunes or uh, on a PC backed up into some sort of photo service. So those are actually three ways to do it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Scott Wilkinson coming up, coming up in a moment. But before we go to Scotty, I want to thank our sponsor on the show today, Qualcomm. Test your phone, not your patients, Qualcomm. And the Snapdragon processor. I have a Snapdragon right here. Uh, do you want faster speeds in your phone? Easy question, easy answer, right? Who, who doesn't want more speed? Data speeds. Waiting's annoying. Waiting in line is annoying. Waiting in traffic's annoying. Waiting for those photos to download, that's annoying. But how can you get faster data speed even without switching car carriers? Well, you just need the right phone with a Qualcomm Snapdragon in it. The Snapdragon 845. So Ookla, which does, you know, the speed test site, they have over a million real-world results from the speed test app, AT&T and T-Mobile, and these were all from Q2. April, May, June, right? Q2. In those millions of downloads, those millions of speed tests on AT&T and T-Mobile, 
Android phones with Snapdragon 845 from Qualcomm Technologies had up to 192% faster data speeds than non-Android phones with Intel modems. That's almost twice as fast. I haven't. I also and I can I can verify this because I have a non-Android phone with an Intel modem, and it is the data speed is not as fast. 192 percent, plus the Snapdragon 845 mobile platform is engineered with powerful features to allow you to do even more with your phone. Immersive XR experiences, VR and augmented reality. What they call it XR. The third generation Qualcomm Hexagon 685 DSP supports sophisticated on-device AI processing. That means your camera can work better, give you better pictures. Your voice recording and voice recognition can work better. And gaming experiences, virtual reality, augmented reality, they all work better thanks to the Hexagon 685. Plus, and I really love this, Qualcomm has built in a secure processing unit. It's designed to help protect personal data. For instance, if you use... Um, biometrics, fingerprinter, eye scanner, face recognition. It'll be stored in isolation, keeping it away from bad guys. Energy efficient, engineered for all-day battery life. And, of course, uh, thanks to Qualcomm and their fast charging, you can charge up to 50% in only 15 minutes. I think all in all, it's a win-win-win. Check out all the data for yourself at qualcomm.com slash twit. Q-U-A-L-C-O-M-M dot com slash twit. And then upgrade your data speeds with a phone powered by Snapdragon 845. Qualcomm.com slash twit. And I thank Qualcomm and the 845 for all that speed and supporting the Tech Guy podcast. So I've, uh, I've analyzed the lyrics of this Red Hot Chili Peppers song. <laughs> uh, yes. It goes hump de bump do bodu hump de bump doop pop. Oh no! <laughs> forty detectives this week. Forty detectives strong taking a stroll down Love Street. Strolling is that so wrong? Can I get my code dependent? <laughs> hump what de bump doop yep. badu? Yeah. What the hell does that mean? <laughs> Maybe the next verse will help. It must have been a hundred miles or any of a hundred styles. It's not about the smile you wear, but the way we make out. When I was <laughs> an all aloner, nothing but a two beach comer. Anybody seen the sky? I'm I'm wide awake now. <laughs> well, now it's perfectly clear. Now it makes perfect sense. <laughs> One reason we uh, we like to talk to Scott is because he does make things perfectly clear on our screens, on our TVs. Mm. He's our home theater guru. That means audio and video. And his his publication is the AVS Forum at avsforum.com. Really an excellent place to learn. all. I've been on an AVS Forum since I wrote my TiVo book, which is almost 20 years ago now. Yeah, so been around yeah it a while. started in 1999. Wow. That's awesome. So it is. It's uh, it's almost twenty years. Yeah. So uh, what what do you what do you have for us today? Oh, I got a couple of good things. Uh, Wayne Boyer is asking the perennial question: mm -hmm. which which TV should I get? He's got a 2008 Samsung, and he'd like to upgrade to four K. Which nowadays, if you buy a TV, you you can't. It's hard not to get four K. Um. And he heard me mention the Vizio P series on this show, which I've talked about a number of times and really like, uh, and also Sony TVs. And he, he mentions that the Vizio, the P series, 65 inch at Costco is about 2000 bucks. And so is the Sony uh, X900F, whereas the Sony X850F is about 500 bucks cheaper. My answer to that is don't get the 850. It's not that it's a bad TV, it's not, but it uses a type of backlight technology called uh, edge lighting. So the LEDs, all LCD TVs have a backlight, some sort of light source that pushes light through the LCD panel that forms the picture. And the 850 and many LCD TVs have those LEDs along the edge of the screen. And that causes problems with uniformity. So if you're looking at a, the black of space, for example, an outer space scene, you might see sort of little flashlighting or little unevenness in the black of space. 
Whereas the Vizio P series and the Sony X900 use what's called ba uh, direct backlighting with full array local dimming. So there's a, a two-dimensional array of LEDs behind the LCD panel, and they shine light directly through. They don't need a light guide plate that, sent, that takes the light coming in from the side and angles it out. It's a much more uniform look to it. Uh, and it's a it's better contrast because those LEDs behind the LCD panel can be brightened and dimmed in small zones. And so if you have a bright thing over here and a dark thing over here, uh, the bright thing will be bright and the dark thing will be dark because the LEDs have been adjusted to uh, accentuate that. So I definitely recommend getting either the P-Series or the X900. Now, I will tell you this. Here's, a, here's some news that we put on the AVS forum last week, Vizio's new flagship called the P-Series Quantum. It's basically a P-Series, and the backlight adds a dimension called quantum dots, which we've talked about on this show. They're nanoparticles, typically a few nanometers in diameter, and they are hit, the, the LEDs behind the screen are blue, and the blue light hits these nanoparticles, and they glow green and red, depending on their size. And so the green and red plus the blue from the uh, LEDs creates white light, and that's what, what uh, illuminates the screen. It can be brighter, and the peak series quantum is quite a bit brighter than the P series, maybe twice as bright. And so it does HDR very, very well. The reason I bring it up is that starting last uh, Wednesday, I believe, and extending through September, the P-Series Quantum is on pretty serious sale Ooh. at um, Costco, Best Buy, uh, and Sam's Club. Now, it's normally $2,100 uh, for even the P-Series Quantum, which is uh, quite a bit better than the regular P-Series, but uh, for this month... Uh, at uh, Costco, it's fifteen hundred bucks. Oh, for how big? Sixty-five. That's amazing. Sixty-five inch. That's the only size the P series Quantum comes in. Sixty-five oh, okay. inch. Okay. But fifteen hundred bucks, and this thing is supposed to have an, a peak light output of two thousand lumens, which is a lot. Believe me. Now, when it's calibrated, it probably won't be quite that bright, but it'll still be one of the brightest TVs on the market, period. And no it's 4K, question. it's HDR, 4K, it's got all the things you HDR, want. 4K, HDR, everything nice. you want. All right. Smart TV, you know, if you want if you want the apps in the TV, it's got that. 1500 bucks for goodness sakes, that's amazing. Is the P-Series for Vizio, that's their top of the line, or is there a... It is. It well, is. the P-Series Quantum now is their top okay. of the line. Okay. The, P, the regular, quote-unquote, regular P-Series is one small step down from that. I'm glad to see Vizio still setting a uh, a very aggressive price point. These are good yeah. TVs. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. boy, that's a great price. Yeah. Wow. wow. So for till the end of the month, that's what I would recommend to uh, Wayne Boyer. That's your is, Super Bowl TV. Get that That's, now. man, oh, man. <laughs> or uh, NFL TV, anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there might be so. some better out by February, but... But for now, that's pretty good. <clears throat> that's really good. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's what I recommend. Certainly, you want to look for a TV that is has what's called a FALD, F-A-L-D, full array, local dimming, backlight. Okay. Um, that's For LCD TVs, that's what you want, not edge lit. And sometimes it's a little hard to tell. So I try to make that as clear as I can anytime I write about it. I do want to remind people, though, when you get an HDR 4K TV, you got to you know upgrade all your sources. Well, there's that. If you want to see it, you know, in, in 4K, you got to get a 4K mm -hmm. UHD Blu-ray with HDR. Well, you don't have to, but no, you do. That's... <laughs> you <laughs> must. No, you don't have to. But what's the point, I guess, if you don't? Well, right? you've got the apps in the TV that'll do 4K. They'll HDR. do 4K. So it comes with Netflix and yeah, you know, all that, all YouTube, that stuff. YouTube, Hulu, all that stuff, all right. Vudu. Uh, but yeah, if you get a, if you want the absolute best quality, you want a UHD blu-ray player i feel like streaming 4k hdr is not as good as as disc based it isn't that's yeah. correct yeah that's correct it's noisier and um there are i mean and it's also annoying because there aren't a, that many discs 4k hdr well, they're expensive they're up there. you have to have dedicated hardware you know it's all of that's a little annoying well um, maybe but in the end when you get a tremendous experience really you know this good. very well oh, yeah yeah 
you know, because you have a, a OLED, a, an LG OLED, which is a different technology than the one we've been talking about here. But uh, it still gives you a tremendous video watching experience, movie watching experience. And I admit when I uh, when I watch even Netflix on that, it does look better. Uh, I don't think yeah. there's as much dynamic range as there would be on a disc, but but well, still, well, because you're yeah, you're limited with you're the compressing with the, it, you're compressing it, and you're yeah. limited with the amount of bandwidth that's coming into right. your house. Right. I mean, you're probably not too limited. You got probably a lot of bandwidth coming into your house. I have but a enough lot of people are. to get the highest quality Netflix is sending. Yeah. yeah, but it's still compressed. It's not as good as Blu-ray. Yeah. Scott Wilkinson is at the AVS Forum. You can read his stuff there, including the uh, price news. In fact, there's a whole discussion in the forum about this uh, new quantum, P-Quantum 65-inch Vizio. If you want to read about it, avsforum.com. Scott joins us every week. Is there a way people can email you, Scott, if they have a question? Oh, sure. You can uh, just uh, email askscottwilkinson at gmail.com or asktheeditors at avsforum.com. Either way, it'll get, it'll get to me. Thanks, Scott. We'll talk again next week. Leo you Laporte, bet. the tech guy. And we're all caught up on our pre-records, aren't we? We are. Yeah. I'm getting to the end. This is my last Saturday show for a month. Yeah. Amazing, huh? Yeah. So you'll have a couple with Rich Demuro. Right. Uh, I've got a couple. I've got a couple. The, the next two are pre-recorded, so yes. I'm off for those. You got two weeks the, off. Yes. Yeah. The sec. The second of those two weeks, I'll be in San Diego at Cedia. So it's good that I mean I would call in on my cell, but you know it would be not, nice. And, and I'm sorry that uh, yeah, but um, that, you know just didn't work. And then the following week, I'll probably talk with Rich about Cedia. Right. Because sure. there's uh, there are a number of things there that are looking pretty interesting. Good. Good. That's exciting. Yeah. That'll be fun. Including this dual laser, uh, Hisense. Yes, Hisense is going to be there with their dual laser. That's yeah, correct. Yeah, that's why. I uh, what I'm probably coming, what I'm coming up for on the sixth, is to look at the one that's currently in your studio, unless they already, unless no, no, they no, install. No, no, they say they're putting the dual in for that. Oh, really? Yeah, that's the whole point of it. Oh, unless well, I'm good. misunderstanding. Well, I'm I'm not 100 percent sure then either. I thought I was going to look at the one you've currently no, my, got. It was and my they understanding were that they were going to put the duel in and bring you up because you, they wanted you to look at it. Okay, well, but may, great. But you may know more than I do. I'll check with Anthony, make sure that that's uh, that I'm understanding sure, that properly. Sure. Because there's no point. Uh, to be honest, we've already you know sat down with Robert Heron and and looked at the single laser. Right. There's right. no point in us redoing that. You might you no. might want to do it. But in that case, well, we wouldn't put you on the screensavers and do a whole show around it because we've already looked at it. Right, right, so right. Exactly. I, I will check with uh, Anthony check, to make sure that's the case. Double check with that. But I'm pretty sure uh, if that's the case, that's fine with me. Totally. In fact, oh, I would love to. Anthony says, myth confirmed. Leo's <laughs> right. We will have the new one for you. Oh, excellent. Well, yeah. that's great. Yeah. That's fantastic. Nice. Okay, well, I will probably want to do a calibration then, and I'm going to come up and, and work Friday evening in the studio when I can turn the lights out in the studio. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, that's that's one thing I need to be able to do for part of the time I'm there is, is to turn yeah. the lights out, and obviously and I can't can, do that during the day while you're working. Yeah, you couldn't do it during the radio show because uh, uh, Kim's in there. Kim and the, and the engineers are in there. Yeah. Well, the engineers aren't doing anything important, but Kim is. <laughs> no, honestly, they're not. But, uh, I mean, they don't have anything to do in there. Um, but but Kim oh, does. Alex says, N I beg to differ. <laughs> <laughs> like a two engineers looking, give me this evil Giving eye. You the, the evil eye, yeah. Yeah. They're preparing for the new screensavers. That's right. That's right. Which I'm happy to co-host. Uh, yeah, that'll be I fun. Good. With you, huh? Yeah. I get to see you. Yeah, I'll be back. In person? Yeah, I'll be back. And then that's, that's why we're doing when I'm it. up there, you're gone. No, that's, that's why fantastic. we're doing that. And that gives High Sense time to put that new one in, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888 Ask Leo. Skyler on the line, Cooper City, Florida. Hi, Skyler. Hi there. How you doing today, Leo? I am great. Thanks for hanging on. Great. This is an honor speaking to you. You've been my mentor for many, many years, and it's, I appreciate all you do for us. Well, thank you. It's my honor to talk to you. What can, sure, I do? Sure. what can I do for you? Uh, well, first of all, a while back, I remember you talking about how you were really impressed with how China has really stepped up their game with mass production and really brought on, brought to light by Apple. And, you know, they can they can make quality products and also mass mass produce them. And it reminded me of a conversation I had with my daughter when she was about five years old. Many years ago uh, at breakfast, she finished her cereal and blurted out, 
wow, the people in China are really busy. <laughs> and I said, Janelle, what, what do you mean, Janelle? She flipped her cereal bowl over and says, they make everything. So it was kind of... kind of. Yeah, they make everything. <laughs> you make everything, for sure. Uh, yeah, very, that's that. uh, from the words of, words of wisdom from the young. That's for sure, that's for sure. But anyway, here's my dilemma. Uh, I purchased a Dell laptop, and after about six months ago, I was... Uh, saving a very large, like 20 gigabyte file overnight. And when I woke up in the morning, it was, couldn't find the hard drive. Oy. It was looping. Yeah. So I found out that is an SD hybrid drive that you mentioned uh, some time ago. Yeah. So I found out, uh, I went and bought Spinrite, uh, and I can't seem to find the drive. It just can't see oh, the, uh, that, the clear okay. drive. So the way these drives work, and they were mm -hmm. Apple did a, a version of it. They called the Fusion Drive, and the one you have sounds like it's the Intel version of this, which combines yeah, it's a, 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 a yeah, it's, it's a very combines a very small amount of solid state storage, usually mm -hmm. like thirty two gigs or less. It's very small. And then a large spinning drive. And the theory was, and, the, and this really comes from the days when solid-state disks were really too expensive for anybody to get. They've come down so much in price now, and they, and I've been told, will continue to fall over the next year, that they're almost, and probably by next year, will be at the same price point as spinning drives. There'll be no price premium to get solid state at which point I, everybody should just get solid state so you have an older technology that really was designed to save money and unfortunately it has some drawbacks first of all it's not as fast as a solid state drive uh, it's really not even much faster than a spinning drive because the idea is the operating system will look at stuff you access more often and put it on the solid state drive because that's where it can load it faster but it's such a small solid state drive it's not most stuff is still on the spinning drive Unknown what's wrong with yours because you have this, this is the other problem with it, this kind of beast with two backs. You have a complicated system, and it could be the solid-state drive died. It could be the spinning drive has disk errors. You know, the fact that you were copying a large file could have stressed it, but it also could have discovered an area of the drive that's been bad all along. You just never wrote to it. The fact that you can't see it in Spinrite worries me a little bit, but I would prefer Spinrite might not be the best diagnostic for this. That's a Spinrite is a hard drive uh, maintenance utility made by my uh, friend Steve Gibson. The, when you boot up the system, does you know how? Um, and, and a lot of times now on systems they hide this, but when you first boot up, it shows you the hardware. The the BIOS shows you the hardware. Uh, if you can't see it, hit Escape. If it's showing the fancy ad for your computer manufacturer hit escape to see if you can get behind it if you can't then you want to go into the setup utility because what you want to do is see if the operating the bios the the basic operating system the uefi sees uh, a drive there because that'll tell you something if it doesn't see a drive there then that means either the computer itself, that SATA bus, where you know the way it's connected is damaged. Maybe the cable fell off. <laughs> you know, I mean, it could be something that yeah. trivial and easy to fix. Uh, it could be that the circuit board on the drive has failed. Uh, that all of those things would mean the drive doesn't show up at all. Like I, I don't. There's no drive there. There's just an empty space there. So that's the first thing to do is to go into setup and see if you can see it. If you can see okay. it, well. It's presenting itself as a drive. That's actually worse news in some ways because now it means, you know, it's maybe a failure uh, internally in the drive, a difficult thing to mm -hmm. recover. You have a backup? It's not as fresh as I wish it would be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. That. yeah. One thing I wanted to mention is I connected this to another computer as its primary drive, and I put it up using Hiren's Boot CD. Good choice. And oddly enough, one of the re yeah, one of the recovery drive it, uh, utilities did see it as a Toshiba drive. Perfect. But on the original drive, it can't see it. Um, and and the one th also, um, my drive was kind of running short on space when I was saving this huge file, not like completely empty. And I'm getting like a partition table error when yeah. I boot up on it. Okay, so so, so it's the second case. The drive is visible. The hardware is okay. The controller's working. Uh, it, it, but <laughs> unfortunately, the drive data itself is damaged. Spinrite. Um, did you try spinwriting it on that second computer? Yeah, I I, I I did it in the original laptop. Couldn't see it. I took it out, put it on a USB enclosure with another computer. Didn't see it. Then I added it to as the primary drive on that second computer. And booted so to high So the mess. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, yeah. When I did that, I could see in Hirons then. Yes. But I ran the utilities ahead on the drive. It couldn't recover that. It ran for days. Nothing was Nothing wrong. was recovered. Yeah. Spin rights are no. going to do any, not yeah. going to do any better than that. That's, uh, yeah, it, <laughs> it's dead, Jim. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, so we still don't know exactly how it's dead. So now is the little spiel I've done before on the ways hard on the, all the ways a hard drive can fail on you. One can be just you know a soft failure, like in the writing of it, the partition table. That's the best kind for you because it means the data is still there. It's just the operating system is having trouble seeing it. Doesn't sound like what you have because the the rescue routines on Hirons are low level. They don't care about the operating system. If they're not able to read mm -hmm. it, then that means that you may have uh, the worst case, which is a, f a hardware failure on the drive. Bad sectors, uh, a bent arm. It doesn't see anything. It can't read it at all. No, not at all. It just keeps keeps searching. Yeah. So it depends days. now how how important it depends how important that data that you have lost is. This is why a good backup is the most economical thing you can do, because to repair yeah. this, now you're going to be calling one of these hardware recovery companies, and they're thousands of dollars. Yeah, I call it drive savers, and it's a lot of cheese. A lot of cheese, baby. <laughs> yeah. That's who I would recommend. Yeah. They're good. Uh, they're just down the road a piece. I know them pretty well. Um, yeah. And the reason they're so expensive is they actually disassemble it, figure out what parts are broken. They have identical parts. You know, they have that Toshiba drive and all the parts for it, and they can replace the part and and maybe get it back. And even then, there's still no guarantee, right? Right. right. So hmm. is, there, is there something you just can't live without? Yeah, well, there's some videos. My daughter is, um, it was like a, a kinsei when you're, oh, when you're yeah. there's some, some videos, not all of them, but some that I took with my phone, which were kind of cool, but you know, it's not the end of the world. I'd like to get them back, but I know you would, but I think at this point yeah. it's uh, such an expensive thing. You've done all the right things, but, yeah. uh, it, yeah, Thanks. it doesn't sound like it's recoverable. I'm so sorry. I, I really, sorry, Skylar, because yeah, okay. you want to say that kinsei, yeah. oh, it's, it's a nice, that's a moment in time. I hope yeah, relatives yeah. have some yeah. videos. Yeah, yeah, we had the professional get the recording too. Oh, good. But, um, All right. Is there any, any utility on Hirons you could recommend over another? No, no, I just system? try them all. <laughs> but uh, really, honestly, at this point, I think you've done. I think you've done all you can. It's time to to dig a little hole in the backyard, put that drive in there, and make a little marker. Say a little prayer over it. It's gone. It's gone. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. And now I give you Scutus Wilkinsonus. <laughs> <laughs> That's I'm going to call you that from now on. Scutus. <laughs> Scutus Wilkinsonus. <laughs> right, let me get your, get your clock here. My um, my Latin name. Yes, it's uh, he's of the genus Wilkinsonus. That's right. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's see. Nine, and then I switch. Go ahead, and you're on. Yeah, I'm yeah. Hey, everybody. MD, buttons. good to see you. Um, M. Heiss is here. Mike Heiss, my buddy, who I will see in San Diego in a week and a half. I love it. The mics are regular when you're on. That's great. I know. Very I do, helpful. too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's a great guy. Really knows his stuff. He's a jolly good CDF fellow, in fact. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, Johnny Deco here just just posted the question. My TV is in the middle of the room, not against a wall. I want to use a bias light, but don't want to light up the entire other side of the room. I don't see how you can avoid it. Um, that is a problem with bias lights, and I've I've experienced it myself. My TV isn't exactly right up against a wall either. It's in in front of a another bunch of TVs, but that's because I review TVs, uh, so it lights up the the stuff behind it and that can be a little distracting i agree um i don't know of any bias lights that just shoot up and and are are beam limited somehow it, it's a good question um i think using it even with the uh with with it illuminating the back of the room uh, is probably a better idea than not using it at all, at least at night. 
during the day, obviously, you, you've got some light in there, probably, unless you have a totally light-controlled room, in which case you probably have a projector. So without total light control during the day, you've got some light in there, and that's fine. At night, you know, um, I don't know. That's a tough question. That's actually a really tough question. <clears throat> I would probably put it in there. Uh, that would be my guess. Anyway, let's see what somebody else has to. <laughs> yeah, Mike. <clears throat> uh, foodie, uh, you are incorrect. P you say P series Vizio TV is Dolby Vision only, no HDR10. That is incorrect. Uh, the Dolby, uh, the uh, Vizio P series and PQ series do Dolby Vision and HDR10 and HLG, which is the high dynamic range, mostly for live broadcast. It was used by the BBC for the World Cup, and also for the World Cup. It was either Dish or DirecTV. I can't remember which one. It was one of them. DirecTV, I'm thinking. But in any event, it, it's incorrect that uh, the P-Series does not do HDR10. It does. So that is the answer to that question. Sorry, Johnny, that I couldn't uh, get any better answer to you on uh, bias light. I have to think about that. And I have to talk to, you know what I would do? In fact, what I will do, and you should too, is contact CinemaQuest at CinemaQuestInc.com. They make the Ideal Loom bias light. And the head guy there, Alan Brown, is a, a video viewing environment expert. He was on my podcast, and we talked about you know the video viewing environment. So actually, I would go to him. And I suggest you do, too, directly if you want. If you don't, I'll go anyway because it's a really good question. I'll post it on the, on the website. But uh, I think that's an excellent idea, now that I think about it, to, uh, to go ask Alan about what if you've got the TV in the middle of the room? So let's see. Yes, Emily the Strange. I go I, as I said. I'll be up. I'll be at uh, Twit on uh, Friday, October fifth, and I'll be working in the evening there on the new TV, and also on the sixth, uh, I'll do my regular segment f on the Tech Guy from the studio, which is very nice. And then I'll be co-hosting uh, Screensavers, talking about the new dual laser ultra short throw projector. Um, yes, Sybil with the Federation hand signs. Exactly. Uh, as I said, uh, Sybil in my, uh, comment to you in the chat room, I just saw for the first time the, uh, new, uh, version or reboot of in search of, and what's so cool about it is that Zachary Quinto is the host. And if you'll remember, the original In Search Of, back in the 70s, was it, or early 80s, uh, it was Leonard Nimoy was the host. So the two people who played Spock uh, are now are, have now both hosted the show In Search Of, which I'm not that interested in. It's, you know, it's mostly a lot of these shows are, uh, you know, it this might mean aliens and this might mean extraterrestrials. And it's all speculation and, and there's no way to... No way to say anything definitively. Swamp Rat, uh, good to see Vizio putting tuners back in. Yeah, they did that, I think, starting last year. They had them out only for a year, I think. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Yes, so that's it. Uh, Lumpy is how soon for 4K and HDR over the air? Uh, that's going to take a while. I don't see that happening anytime soon it's uh, it depends on this uh, uh, specification called ATSC 3.0 uh, which is now finally finished I believe uh, but it needs to be implemented now and how many broadcasters are going to actually implement it it can use some of the existing infrastructure but it needs some new infrastructure as well uh, and so I think that's going to take a while uh, to for, for broadcasters to start implementing that. Uh, Jim Four, sadly, I'm not still doing the uh, Home Theater Geeks podcast. Uh, I am 
working on a couple of new things that will appear on YouTube fairly soon. So watch for that. Uh, big sports fan. Do I like to watch sports on TV? The answer is no. <laughs> I am not at all a sports person. The only sport, the only sports I watch on TV is, is baseball, and really only plays of the week. Actually, last night my wife and I were at uh, Dodger Stadium. We we watched the Dodgers trounce the Padres, um, but apparently the Padres are a very poor team this year. I don't even follow that kind of stuff. I know the Dodgers had a really strong winning streak there for a while, and then they kind of slumped for a while. I, for I root for the Dodgers only because I live in L.A. I forgot to ask you, how was the uh, concert? Uh, the concert. Your anniversary concert. Oh, that was great. Yeah, we went to the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah. Uh, Rodrigo y Gabriela and the L.A. Phil with uh, Gustavo Dudamel. Excellent, excellent. What? Nice. They were they were too loud. Uh, the the sound. They were too was, loud. They yeah, amplified them. I guess they have to, huh? Well, yeah. It's like eighteen thousand people at yeah. the Hollywood Bowl. Uh, uh, but uh, yeah, they the acoustic guitars. But they amplified them, and it was right. pretty loud. Yeah. All right, my friend. Sadly. All right. Thank hey, you listen, so man, much. Have a great vacation. It will be a month before I a see you. A month vacation, man. Well, oh my god. I know. Have have a wonderful time. Give my best to Lisa. Actually, more than a month. I won't see you. Uh, yeah, more than a month because I get yeah. back the twenty third, but we I won't be doing a show till that following week. So right, August right. August twenty uh, ninth. I'll see you. I'll Thanks, see you Scott. then. Bye. Take care. Bye bye. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Oh my goodness, it's time to talk high tech. Computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We've got smartphones. We got smartwatches. We got uh, virtual reality goggles. Uh, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo if you want to talk about that. Eighty-eight, <laughs> or, or any of that, anything with a chip in it. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo. Those virtual reality uh, goggles. I think we're a little way off. There's a company called uh, Magic Leap. That has, you know, we've seen uh, augmented reality. Well, so let me make the distinction. We've seen virtual reality. First, Oculus. It's now a Facebook company. Then the Oculus Rift. And now the Oculus Go. And uh, then a company called HTC made something called the Vive. Both of those were pretty much used for gaming. Uh, Samsung has this thing called the Gear VR. Have you have you played with that? That really is gaming a little bit, but but it's it's you have to put your smartphone in it. So it's not the highest end processor. It's more for, uh, you know, watch movies or look at, you know, there's a lot of 360 degree movies made now where you, you're you looking at something, but you can look around with these goggles on even behind you or above you or below you and see the, the whole world, the sphere, the 360 degree sphere all the way around you. That's kind of interesting. I have one of those cameras. I'm thinking of bringing that on vacation. I don't know why. And then, <laughs> and then, uh, and then. There's augmented reality, so that's virtual reality, where you really don't see anything. You just you're looking at two screens in front of your eyes, and you don't see the rest of the world, your your world at all. Augmented reality, you still see your world, but you see stuff see stuff superimposed on your world. Microsoft's Hololens is an example, and there's another one now out called uh, the Magic Leap. The Magic Leap One. Uh, Hololens was how much? Two thousand five hundred, I think. The Magic Leap. One and both of these are called developer editions, so they're, you know, they they don't expect to, consumers to buy these at you know for thousands of dollars, but they figure developers who want to make applications for it might, or just really hardcore enthusiasts. The uh, you look kind of silly wearing these Hololens. At least you know they don't look so different from a. A VR helmet, so people would kind of understand what you're doing. The, the Magic Leaps look more like uh, goggles, like motorcycle goggles. People might just think you have very elaborate motorcycle goggles on. <laughs> uh, you look like a little bit like an alien, a little bit like an ant. The real problem is this stuff is is such early days. It's very primitive, and a lot of experts in this stuff say, "Well, think about the earliest days of home video games, right?" Do you remember getting the Atari VCS the uh, and playing, uh, you know, 
Pong on it or Pitfall. They were really primitive. They had lines and blocks, and that's about it. The sounds were really, really... I mean, it, if you looked at that and compared it even to the state of the art of, of, of gaming at the time, it would, was primitive. You know, you could go to a Chuck E. Cheese Pizza Time Theater, a, a video game arcade, and play stuff that was a little more sophisticated than that. Of course, today, we've gone well beyond that. And if you have an Xbox or a PlayStation, you could play games that are very high quality, very realistic, 4K, high dynamic range. They're not quite the real world, but they're getting close. So how long did that take? 30 years? I don't think VR will take quite that long, but maybe in the 10, 20 years, augmented reality, virtual reality, they'll, they'll be something real. Maybe. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. 8888 Ask Leo. Anyway, that's the kind of thing we, uh, we talk about, love talking about. Let's go to line three. Jonathan, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Hello, Jonathan. Hey, Leo. Hey, I have a question for you and a photo app recommendation. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. But first, I wanted to thank you. You made me a, uh, uh, the envy of some of my geek friends this past week. Um, I, we watch Mac Break Weekly or listen to Mac Break Weekly, and uh, a friend of mine texted me and said, Leo just gave you a shout-out on Mac Break Weekly. Oh, you were showing a, a poster I had sent you. Oh, yeah. Uh, I love this poster. This is hysterical. Yeah. I have it right here. Thank you for sending this. Oh, sure. Yeah. it's uh, it's. Where did you get this? It's kind of a dystopian <laughs> view of the past. <laughs> it's a local company here in Pittsburgh. They're called Alternate Histories. And uh, they do some some really great stuff, really fun stuff. This one looks like one of those '50s, you know, ads, and you might have seen in the back of Life magazine, a uh, perturbed woman in '50s garb. Donna, think Donna Reed saying, "What do you mean? My computer wants to kill me?" And know the warning signs of computer sentience. Does the machine work for man or vice versa? Versa, sinister, emotionless, always watching and waiting. Th I can't thank you enough. I'm just my only conundrum now is where to put this. I love this. This is great. <laughs> oh, I'm so glad. Well, check yeah. out their website. They have a lot of good. Stuff. I shall. Alternate histories. Alternate yeah. histories. Yeah. Uh, so I have a, a question about backup. Okay. Um, I was doing some uh, cleaning and found about a dozen external hard drives that I've gotten <laughs> together over the years. <laughs> it reminds me of kind of what I used to do with videotapes, right? Start a videotape and then think, ah, I want to put a fresh one in to take more videos of the kids. Yeah. <laughs> Where did you store you know, 20 hard drives? Boxes. <laughs> anywhere. You must have a basement or an attic. That's all I can think. <laughs> wow. Well, and so now, and of course, I didn't label them. They're not organized. And I want to know the best way to kind of, I don't want to get rid of these hard drives, of course, because the more backups, the better, but <laughs> kind of consolidate yeah. on all these. Yeah. Um, they're, they're mostly kind of like the, uh, the bare bones, like um, SATA drives, like you would find if you opened a tower PC. No, 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 no. These are external hard drives. USB. So they all have a USB interface. Yes. Oh, well, that makes it easier. I was going to recommend a device from a company called Newer Tech that would let you connect these up as USB, but they're already USB. Yes. Okay. So uh, what you really need, uh, I mean, I guess you could go onesie-twosie, plug them into a computer and see what you can find. Um, but what you're thinking what you'd like to do is one by one copy the co entire contents over? Yeah, I was thinking of maybe getting, now that storage is so cheap, maybe getting a, let's say, a four terabyte. Yeah. Because a lot of these are smaller. Oh, yeah. They're probably copy 20 them. megabytes, some of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And copy them all onto the big one. And then, you know, that way everything would be together and I could, you know, just organize it that way. But I wanted to see what you thought. Yeah. There's a program that's specifically for this. I don't, there must be more people like you in the world. It's called, <laughs> it's called Win Catalog. And uh, it's at wincatalog.com. Is that Windows? Because I'm Mac. Oh, you're Mac. Oh, nuts. <laughs> Nobody, hey, I'm Mac because of you. Oh, uh, well, I'm, I'm a Mac guy too. So I guess I shouldn't say that. But uh, yeah, the idea is exactly what I think you would want, which is you one by one plug these in. It goes out, it reads them, it makes a giant catalog. And then, um, and then you can opt to ca copy them over or not. One of the reasons you'd want to do that first is because 
you don't want to dupli have duplicates. And I bet right. you there's a lot of duplicates. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. So you kind of want a catalog first. Um, let me look and see. I don't, off the top of, I mean, I see th some things like Disc Catalog Maker. Um, drag and drop your disc icon on the catalog window. Automatically add a burning... Yeah, this is more for CDs. That's a, let's open that one up because um, that's a really good question. What do people use to catalog multiple hard drives on a Macintosh? Yeah, because I, I use Super Duper, and I'm sure maybe six of those are Super Duper backups. Oh, yeah. I'm sure there's exactly. a lot of yeah, you probably yeah. yeah, you don't want to make copies of all of that. Uh, and speaking of... Uh, hold on a second. I want to get your app in just a second. So hang on, okay? But I have to Got take it. a break for our five sponsors. Um, and I also want to give the chat room and the others in the uh, audience to, a chance to come up with something for cataloging external drives on a Macintosh. Cataloging and optionally copying. I wonder what we would do with that. Part of the problem is going to be the file formats, the drive formats... If you have NTFS drives, for instance, the Macintosh won't be able to read them at all. Uh, but there is software you could put on there. I'll talk about that in a second. Back to the calls in just a bit. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. 8888, ask Leo, and we'll get uh, Jonathan's app recommendation right after this. Doing a little jitterbug there. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. We've been talking to Jonathan in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He's got, he found a couple of dozen hard drives in boxes, and he wants to catalog them on his Mac. And uh, MD in our chat room found something for you, uh, Jonathan, that might really be nice. It's uh, cdfinder.de, but their new version is called NeoFinder. And do you think some of that stuff is media? Oh, it's everything. Yeah, because yeah, this does a nice media. thing with media because photos and, uh, and videos, it'll show a thumbnail, which would be also very helpful. And So this is a free trial version you can, uh, you can use. And then there's another one on the App Store called Disk Catalog Maker. Or though, if you get it from the website, you can do a trial version, a 30-day trial version of that. I would try one of those, too. Great. Thank yeah, you. That'll get you, get you started anyway. One nice thing about, I thought was very interesting about NeoFinder... Uh, uh, some of those disks might have been made in your Windows days, and they might be file formats that Macintosh can't read. It can read FAT32, but it, uh, and it can read, uh, of course, Apple file formats, but it can't read NTFS. And the nice thing about NeoFinder, it says it will read NTFS disks, which is pretty nice. So that would save you some money. Otherwise, you'd have to go to Paragon, somebody like that, and get a, a NTFS adapter for the Macintosh. It lets you. It's a little bit of a driver, basically, a little bit of software that would read N NTFS. Excellent. So, and by the way, Leo, about backups. I'm glad you mentioned backing up off site because there's that story about Francis Ford Coppola about 15 years ago. He was diligent about backup, but he got robbed of his computers, his backups. He said at the time he lost about 15 years of writing and family photos. I remember reading that. I was so yeah. sad. Super important. Yeah. 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 But so my photo app recommendation, I'm a casual amateur and I'm pretty good when it comes to editing at simple things like exposure and adjusting color, that sort of thing, but not so much the Photoshop ninja stuff like uh, removing objects. Have you heard of Mender? M-E-N-D-R. No, tell me about Mender. No, no final E, of course. So it's kind of a gig economy thing. It's uh, iOS, and I think it's Android, where you upload a photo, and they have editors all over the oh, world. that's great. I, think, yeah, <laughs> I love that idea. Yeah, I think all over the world, at least North America. And um, so within a few minutes, they take you tell them what you want. I used it to remove some – I had a picture of some uh, kids on a beach – and they removed the other people who were on the beach. Did a great job. It was only a few dollars. Had a nice interaction with the editor. I think you get one free revision. But I just love these people. That great is work. really cool. So they're crowdsourcing photo editors. Yes. Yes. So Thank instead you. of you yes. having to do it, 
mender finds somebody and uh, and you pay them a couple of bucks and they'll do it. And truthfully, right. I this is a great idea because there are so many people out there, and I watch these guys who go, whoop, 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 see, it's all fixed. Yep. And I think, I could never have done that. It'd take me all day. So that's a great tip. M-E-N-D-R. It's uh, uh, the uh, website is uh, M-E-N-D-R dot com. What yeah, I worked tip. with I worked at an ad agency, and I used to ask some of my graphic design yeah. friends, but I felt bad doing it. And I've recommended to them to be editors with this platform because when they, when they have a few minutes, they can just grab a photo and do it. Wow, that's great! iOS and Android, you're right. Uh, M E N D R, yeah. and it's free. It's a free app, I think. But uh, of course, yeah, you have oh, to sure. pay for the the retouching. But and well, they do great. Well, the worth people it. I've had do great work. Yes. What a great tip! Thank you so much, Jonathan. Thank you, Leo. Have, have a great day. Take care. I love that. M E N D R. I'm going to make a note of that one. I'm lazy. Andy in New Jersey, <laughs> Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Andy. Hi, Leo. How you doing? I'm well. Welcome. I, uh, I have a security question for you. You might think I'm being a little too paranoid. You might not. But first, I wanted to say thank you. And back in 2004, I was dealing with uh, a situation where every parent and adult in my life was telling me to not go to school and get ready for them again. And you responded to an email telling me to go to college and some other things. <laughs> they were, so, wait a minute. They were saying don't bother because the world's at, at coming to an end? Yeah, we, we this was a long time ago. We talked about that, but nonetheless. Wow! So you did go to school. school. Yeah, you know, education. do it because you love it, even if the world's coming to the end. And hey, maybe it won't come to an end, <laughs> and uh, you'll have a skill. Yeah. Well, you definitely set a sixteen-year-old kid straight. Now I'm thirty, and I'm doing okay. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. It's nice to and talk the to you. Here. And the, and it didn't come. <laughs> you know what? It could happen tomorrow. But you Good. you have some fun while you're while while we're here. That's great, Andy. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for uh, telling me about that. So as far as my situation goes, I have a work-at-home job, and uh, they have an iMac that hooks up to my Xfinity gateway router, and it's a connection I pay for, but their policy is that any uh, visible traffic on the network from any device, even you know mine, they have the right to audit uh, whenever they want. Who's they? And... Uh, uh, my employer, who shall remain nameless. Yeah, so that's actually a good thing to keep in mind, that when you're on a work network or using work equipment, the employer has that right. They don't even have to tell you that. They they just have the right. Yeah. So you're using a... And I figured that. Do you pay for that? You said, though, that you pay for the Xfinity, or is that not the case? I, uh, I pay for everything except for the computer itself. So, and, and you know, I was thinking and doing some research on it, and... If they, they if you use your computer on your network, they have no right to access that. Yeah, that's that was my thought too. Um, however, human resources had other thoughts. So. Well, you could sue the heck out of them. No, are you on company okay. time? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I guess if you're on company time, so part of this comes from not a, a you know a desire to spy on you. But the, a, a very legitimate concern companies have uh, over things like sexual harassment lawsuits. If they're responsible yeah. for creating a safe workplace, are you working at home? Yeah, um, remote IT for a, a subcontractor okay. that works for well, that's a, a larger a, that's company. That's a little and weird. My concern is more or less, um, you know, a rogue employee taking advantage of yeah, the, spying on you. Um, hang on, hang on a second. I got to take a break. I really, this is an interesting one. Uh, maybe if there's a lawyer listening, we can get some help. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Okay, so you work as a remote IT guy for this company. Mm -hmm. You use a company yeah. computer, but you pay for and use your own network. Uh, correct. Uh, if uh, And then in order to do this, do you log into a company network? Uh, well, yeah, here's the, the setup. You know, I got the Xfinity router with, you know, three... Ethernet connections. I ran myself one to their machine, which at times is not on the VPN, but most of the time is going to be software hooked up to their Cisco VPN. And uh, I was thinking, you know, so the auditing that they're doing, adding a separate router, and yeah, so the audit, VPN the auditing that, stuff. yeah, the auditing that they're doing uh, is only of the stuff that you do over their VPN. 
they could, in theory, have software on that particular PC that also monitors it and sends screenshots back to the home office, that kind of thing. But uh, generally speaking, unless they're particularly uh, aggressive, they're not monitoring other traffic. Like if you took another computer, got on your Xfinity, didn't do the VPN to work, but just used your router to go out to the outside world, they'd have no access to that. Unless they really want to be malicious. Yeah, you know, like I, I was thinking, we're, you know, some random rogue employee, uh, you know, doing no, but, uh, yeah, but do, the, but Yeah, but he'd have to, in order to do that, he'd have to either put some malware on the router or malware on your other computers. If okay. my suggest, Here's what my suggestion would be, that when you're doing this, disconnect the company computer from the router. Well, that's the thing. They want it on all the time. Um, you know, which... They want it on it all is. the time. Yeah, so they can do maintenance whenever they'd like and whatnot. And, you know, even when the VPN's off, they are able to remote desktop in and whatnot. And I'm thinking, well, if they're that far, they could easily look into my network shares. Yeah, they're network. on your network. No, 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 they are but, on yeah, your network. Exactly. Yeah. So would a separate router, like maybe a, a VPN router, a separate one hooked up to the Xfinity on a whole separate, you know, subnet of IPs be enough or, yes. or too much? So one way, no, well, let me think what you could do here. Um, if they say that this is a, must be a persistent connection at all times, that their company-provided desktop has to be on, VPN has to be running, connected to the router, and that router is obviously always connected to the Internet. That means they're always keeping a channel open. Because their computer is on your network, it could be used to snoop on other network traffic. That's correct. The best yeah. way to... I don't think it's their intent, but, you know. The problem is that the Xfinity router... Would they allow you... See, for instance, one of the things you could do is you could use a separate router to connect to the Xfinity router. You know, like one of these tiny hardware firewalls I'm always talking about. Uh, yeah. In fact, that might be the best way to do this. So you get a, a little uh, firewall that you connect another computer to. It connects to the Comcast, but uses a VPN to go pass through the Comcast and out to another router. They would have no access to anything you do at that point. If you didn't use yeah. a VPN when you connect to the router, even if you used another router, they'd see that traffic because the traffic's not encrypted when it gets to the Comcast router. Yeah, well, I was thinking, of, you know, like you said, a router VPN built in. That way I don't have to set up all my devices, yeah. you know, individually. Yeah. My Xbox would even be on the VPN at that point. Yeah. I think you that could, might be great. You could do that. It's going to give you some overhead because of the VPN. Yeah. I'm okay. Do with they that, do though, they insist brother. that you use the Xfinity router? Is that part of the deal? No, uh, you know, I was honestly thinking about getting a, a separate DSL. That's what I would do. Link phone line, just yeah. pay for the extra connection. Another another way to do this would be to get a more sophisticated. I I don't like these Xfinity routers anyway. You still need to use the Comcast cable box. You know, the uh, cable modem mm -hmm. box, but you don't need to use its its router. And get another router, like, say, the Ubiquiti Edge Router X, which lets you do VLANs, and you can do discrete LANs, one to your work desktop and one to something else. Hold on a second. We're going to come back. Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy, 8888. Ask Leo the phone number if you've got a question, a comment, a suggestion. We've been talking to Andy, who has an interesting work situation. <laughs> uh, he's a remote IT guy. His, uh, his uh, company requires him to use a company laptop at home that's always connected to their virtual private network, and he may not turn it off. So his personal Internet is being used by this company laptop to phone home at all times. His concern is that this company laptop, if somebody at work decided to be malicious, has access to its net, his network. And you're right, Jonathan, it does. It's just sitting... And this is, by the way, the same thing we talk about with other Internet of Things devices, like an Amazon Echo or a, a Ring doorbell. When, when these devices are put on your home network, they are on your network. And if somebody were to commandeer them, they could use them to get on your network. So you... You know, you trust your company. Its company's not going to do anything malicious. But it does, in fact, have a, have 
a uh, device inside the house, <laughs> inside your network. So your your best bet would be to isolate it somehow so that you could then do whatever you want without fear that anybody's spying on you. Um, it's interesting the company's requiring this. Um, yeah, and they were fuzzy when asked directly because, you know, I asked HR about what I was signing. And I was like, the wording here is pretty all-encompassing and... They were pretty unsure, but yeah, they're always going to. Yeah, any any legal document they're going to give you is always going to err in their side. That's you yeah. know, I mean, but you don't want to hire a lawyer before you sign it. But that's really the the right thing to do because they're not going to do anything uh, to benefit you. Everything's going to be worded in such a way that they go to court, they have all the rights. And in fact, courts yeah. have always upheld employers do have a lot of rights. This is an unusual situation because the employer now is inside your house, which you have a right to privacy. Uh, you know, you you certainly if they started spying on you, you'd have recourse. Because if yeah. you're using your personal, as, if you're using their computer, no. But if you're using your personal computer and they uh, did something that uh, sp to spy on you, even though you gave them permission to have their computer in your house, that would be illegal. So that's good to know. You are protected in that regard. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm pretty sure on that, in that in that regard, no matter what you sign, they don't have the right to spy on your private traffic. Only stuff that you do on the work network with the work computer. In other words, the VPN and that computer. However, let's say you really do want to protect yourself. So because they have access to your network through the router, the best thing to do would be to isolate their computer from the rest of your network. And there are a couple of ways to do that. The Xfinity router you have may not have that capability, but a third, many third-party routers do. It's something called VLAN or Virtual Local Area Network, where if you had, it's in effect two networks in your house, one for the company computer and one for everything else, you'd be safe because that company computer couldn't cross the barrier and see what you're doing. That's one, uh, by the way, solution for Internet of Things devices. If you don't want your Amazon Echo to become a gateway to bad guys into your network, you put it on a separate network. And you can do that with a virtual LAN. So you could look for, you, you'd have to, you have to keep using the Comcast cable modem, but you don't have to use their router. So you could have their, put their router in bridge mode so that it's not doing any routing. It's just a passive device. You need then a couple of there'd be a couple of ways to do this. One would be have a dedicated router. Well, no, you really want you now you want some isolation. Uh, I use you know there's one solution that comes from Xfinity. <laughs> they uh, they what they call XFi. They use plumes. Uh, these are those little silver things that the plume router and plume uh, is has an interesting feature. It has a VLAN feature built into it. They don't call it that, but they have three network levels. They have a guest level which has access to nothing but the internet. They have the homeowner level, which has access to everything. And they kind of have a middle level, uh, which is internet only. The internet only level, you could put your corporate computer on the internet only level with a plume, and then everything else that's going on would be isolated. That might be the solution. Uh, and you could do that without getting rid of your Xfinity router. You might inquire from Xfinity if you can get one of these plume, if, if, and I don't know, and somebody who, who uses Plume on Xfinity would have to tell me if they give you access to all the features. This is a feature that's built into the regular Plume. Um, but that's one of many routers that would do this. It's a VLAN is what you need. Another way to do this okay. would be to disable the routing in the Xfinity. Get something, $50 uh, hardware router, it's not Wi-Fi, called the U Ubiquity Edge Router X. It's inexpensive. It has four ports on it. Each of those ports can be on a VLAN, a separate LAN. A little complicated to set up, but you're a smart guy. You could figure this out. Uh, and by VLANing yeah, like it, project. You, yeah, you can isolate them. So that's the key word to do some Googling on is a VLAN, how to set up a VLAN in your house, a virtual network that is not visible to the corporate computer. And if all else fails, I'll just get another ISP. <laughs> yeah, you know what? If you got a separate ISP, I, I think you should make a case that, well, okay, fine, but you're going to be paying for this internet access through Xfinity. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that seems... Uh, that that seems, would be beautiful, but yeah, that's unfortunately that's, not happening. Yeah, sometimes you need a job more than you need to be right. Uh, so that's life, yeah. right? And that's kind of what they're insisting on. And I think you're right. I don't think it's nefarious. They're trying to protect themselves. If you started, uh, you know, Bitcoin mining 
or serving pornography on their uh, computer, they'd want to be able to see that. So they, they keep an eye on those kinds of things. Uh, any company is going to do that and, and, and legally has the right to do that. The trick is to isolate their computer from the rest of your house. If you get another router that has VLAN capability, that'll do it. All right, I'll keep doing my research. I really appreciate your help. Yeah, my pleasure. And thanks for telling me about those days long ago. I'm, I'm really pleased that worked out for you. Yeah, I'm glad the world's still here and glad you are. We're still here. We're not living time. in a bunker yet. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Andy. Take care. 8888, uh, ask Leo. Yeah, that's a, that's a more complicated networking uh, issue, but it's something I think you all want to think about and keep in mind that any device that you put on your network, your home network, uh, has access to all the other devices. You know, you're, the theory being that it, once you're on your own network, your personal network, it's, it's a secure network. That's why you can, you can get in trouble in a business. If somebody comes from home with their laptop, their laptop has a virus, plugs it into your company's network, and it can then spread throughout the network. The network's presumed to be safe. Now, actually, more, more and more companies are doing, to, uh, adopting protection against that because it's happened. I think it happened to CNN. As I remember, somebody brought in a, a laptop, might even be a company laptop, but he infected it at home. Inside CNN, you can't get a virus because they have all sorts of antivirus protection, right, on inbound traffic. But the guy brought it home, got infected, brought it in. Now it's inside all that protection and infected everything else and brought a bunch of their computers to it, their knees. This was many years ago. Nowadays, we have ways to prevent that. So, And one of the ways is, is by segmenting, dividing up your network into pieces that can't talk to one another. The really primitive way to do this, my friend Steve Gibson calls the three-router solution. I don't know if this is practical, but buying three routers, <laughs> I don't think, I think this is, I don't even want to repeat it. It's so nutty. But you could Google the three-router solution and see the, the kind of the map of how you would do this. One is connected to the outside world. One is connected to a uh, uh, less than safe network, maybe a bunch of it. It's actually a good idea if you have a bunch of Internet of Things devices, connect them to uh, a separate router. And then the, the third router is your router for getting out and into the world. Having a secure and an insecure local area network. I guess that, that would be the best way to describe it. I, if you Google three dumb routers, <laughs> you'll, either, you'll either find a Three Stooges episode <laughs> or you'll find... The three-router solution to IoT security. Can't can't say I. Uh, it's the it's certainly not the least expensive way to do this. 8888 ask Leo. <laughs> That's the phone number. Uh, if you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, the website. And I'll put all this stuff up on the website. That saves you uh, writing anything down. Is techguylabs.com. Go to techguylabs.com. We'll even put a link to Steve Gibson's three dumb routers solution. TechGuyLabs.com 8888-ASK-LEO Leo Laporte, the Tech Guy 8888-ASK-LEO And Roland is in the uh, Hutchison, Kansas area with a call. Hello, Roland. Hey, Leo. Good to talk to you again. It's been a while. Good to talk to you. Um, I listened to your, your uh, MacBook Weekly and I hear you and Andy talking about, I believe it's VLC, but there's like two components to it, to recording your DVDs and then burning them back off. Oh, yeah. So um, if you have DVDs and you want to make hard drive copies of the DVD, the two programs mm -hmm. we talk about, uh, the first one uh, you need is um, uh, from the French folks. It's called Handbrake, H-A-N-D-B-R-A-K-E dot F-R. Actually, both mm -hmm. of these are from France. And Handbrake is a transcoder. And actually, it's, I think, a front end to a command line utility called FFmpeg. But basically what it does is it takes video in one format, in, the, in this case, in the uh, MPEG-2 format on that DVD, and converts it to a format that you can store on a hard drive more compactly and play back on most devices. In most cases, that would be an MP4. But it, it has settings that say, you know, what is it you want to read and what is it you want to, re you know, record for? Is it rec Are you recording for an iPhone? Are you recording for a computer? All of that stuff. So, and it takes a little while to churn on it. Uh, it's pretty efficient, but it will churn on it and uh, then convert it to that format. You can get one DVD usually into something 
a little less than a gigabyte in size, which is pretty good. Doesn't include the menus, right. doesn't include any of that stuff. The problem is most DVDs are copy protected. And Handbrake used to include the software to, to remove copy protection, but they're worried, they were worried about getting sued because the motion picture industry is kind of notoriously sensitive about this. <laughs> I mean, after all, they put the copy protection in the first place. Of course, it was broken by a high school student within a year but uh, <laughs> and never repaired, but they don't like you to do that. So uh, the Handbrake guy said, well, here's what you do. In fact, it'll say this when you, when you first use Handbrake. If you want to copy DVDs, you now need another program called the Video Land Client, or VLC. You can get that from videoland.org. VLC is a DVD player. So one of the reasons that DVDs copy protection, uh, it's called CSS, was broken so quickly is it's probably really the, the flaw with all of these schemes. In order for, you can encrypt a DVD, but in order for it to be played back, it has to be decrypted, right? A, a player can't just play encrypted data. It has to turn it into real data. So the, D, the DVD is decrypted using a key that's widely known. All players have that key. So what happens is, in order to play the DVD, VLC opens. It stores the key in memory. Uh, and then Handbrake goes, oh, thank you for decrypting that disk. And then is able to rip it. So you need the two together. Uh, you, what I think, I, I haven't done it in a while, but I think you open the disk first with VLC uh, run Handbrake, then you can close VLC, and Handbrake can go on from there. Right. Now, my question was, I thought that you could actually record another DVD off of it so, like, the kids wouldn't tear up your, your DVDs. Now, that's a different thing. Yeah, so if you, you, you okay. can kind of, but if you're going to do that, what I would suggest instead is imaging the DVD, not transcoding it. So remember I said Handbrake takes the format of the DVD and changes it. Uh, you really don't want to make a DVD from that because now you're changing it back, and it, that's a two-step process that's degrading it in each step. So you don't really want that. You want DVD imaging uh, software that okay. will copy the DVD image onto your hard drive and then burn it back. And uh, that's okay. there's, a, there's a whole bunch. That's a different process. If Yeah, if you want to make a copy of a DVD. And now this is, of course, even more sensitive. The mo motion picture industry is really afraid of this. Uh, but image burn is the one most people use. I M G B U R N. It now is that Windows or PC? I'm running a Mac. Oh, yeah, that's uh, that's Windows. Um, I wonder if some of the Mac image burn is very popular on the Windows folks. What are some of the uh, tools people use on Macintosh for burning? It? There was um, Mac uh, DVD ripper. Not it's not ripping. It's uh, imaging. There were uh, there have been a couple of these, and I just don't remember the names off the top of my head. Maybe Image Burn works. Oh, yeah. works. I would look at Image Burn, but there are other. Oh, Disco. That's the one I was thinking of. I don't know if Disco. Oh yeah, it is still around. Discoapp.com. D-I-S-C-O. So what you want is something that will take the DVD, make a c image of it. You can play that image back. It's an ISO file that you could play back. Plex will play it, and others will play it back. But you could also use it okay. to burn, and it would make an identical copy uh, on a burned disk. Okay. Okay, so I was using the wrong stuff to do what I thought I was doing. Okay. Yeah, what you're, what you're doing is fine, too. You could give the kids um, a player, not a DVD player, but a player that would play back that MP4 file you make with Handbrake, put it on a USB key and play it back. That's probably a better way to do it because you can get many, many more movies in the same space. But if you really want right. them to... Much yeah, it's it, they're much more compact, but because it, it, a DVD is about four point seven gigabytes, a ripped DVD right. using handbrakes about a quarter that size. Okay, yeah. So a USB, I can get several movies on it and be a lot easier to move on. Yeah, the exactly. Rides or yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. Okay. That's what most people do. Are they playing it back on an iPad or something like that? Well, some of them. Are, sometimes it's an iPad. Sometimes it's in the back of the uh, Pacifica. You. And the Pacifica has a DVD player. Right, 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 right. right. Um, some DVD That's players, I bet the Pacifica's DVD player will do this. Some DVD players will play back data DVDs. If you put, and you can just try, burn one disc. Instead of burning it like a DVD, burn it like an MP4 and see if it'll be play. if the Pacifica drive uh, uh, player will play it. Sometimes okay. they will. Sometimes it will. It needs the ability to play a data disc. 
Okay, well, I know it also has like an SD card that I could put you in. That's even better. It has an SD card. Do it that way. Yeah. That, that one file, then you can easily put it on an SD card. You can put it on a USB stick. You can put it on the iPad. It'll play everywhere. Okay. That's what you use Handbrake right, well, for. That works, then. Thank you very much. My Taylor. pleasure, yeah. Somebody in the chat room saying DVD Fab is a program that will make copies on a Mac of uh, DVDs. Just, you know, copy it back and forth. They do it we're working on Windows 2. It's $55, dvdfab.cn. Note the CN. That means it's from China where they don't care about copyright. <laughs> and that's part of the problem is the motion picture industry is not a fan of people making copies of their discs. Technically, I think it is illegal. I think it is. The Digital Millennium Copyright Act says it's illegal to reverse engineer copy protection. That's what these programs do. So they're in, you know, in defiance of the law. That's why they have to be elsewhere. I don't think anybody's ever gotten in trouble for making personal copies of DVDs. Problem is you need this software to do it, but uh, I don't think the judge would go after you. If you took them and then sold them online, yes. And so there are, you know, there are people who rent movies, make copies, and sell them. That's wrong. That's just wrong. But if you bought a movie and you own it and you want to make a copy that the kids can play so it doesn't ruin the DVD... That's a copy for archival purposes. It's always been legal in analog media. There is actually a law that says that's legal in analog media. But digital media, nobody ever made that law. So it is technically illegal. I don't think anybody would ever get in trouble for making an archival copy of something you own for personal purposes. Make sure you own the movie. Buy the movie. Then the movie maker can't get unhappy. You paid for the movie. You bought it. You're just making a cut. You put it in a different format to make it easier to play as you drive along the road in your Pacifica. How could anybody get mad at that? Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Let's take a break. We're going to keep taking calls after the show for uh, vacation purposes. So keep calling. Well, hey, 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 how are you today? Leo Laporte, the tech guy here. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography. We talk about smartphones. We talk about smart watches. Johnny Jett, our travel guy, will not be here this Saturday. He will be here tomorrow. He's traveling. Whoa, I'll be darned. But uh, so <laughs> we also talk about using technology to travel better with Johnny. 8888-ASK-LEO. That's the phone number. 888 827 Five five three six. That's the number you can call if you have a question or a comment or a suggestion. You just want to talk about tech like Paul does in Ventura, California. Hello, Paul. Yeah, hey, Leo. Nice to nice to talk to you. Thanks for taking my call. My pleasure. Hey, I wanted to. So I I think I want to buy a three D printer, and I've been looking into the whole uh, technology. It, it's not for an industrial use. It's just a hobby. Um, I, I obviously don't want to spend two or three hundred dollars and turn around and discover I, I'm, I'm dissatisfied or it doesn't have the capacity or capabilities. I also don't want to spend fifteen hundred dollars to see the same thing on sale next year for half that. So I'm I'm just wondering. I if can't you, I can't prevent that. <laughs> that that happens all the time. What do you want to do with a 3D printer? You just want to want to learn about it, play with it. I want to learn about it. I want to play with it. I, I, the one side I may want to just spend that you can buy entry levels for a couple of hundred dollars, but I, I, I suspect that I'm going to quickly probably understand it and want to make sure it has at least the capabilities to do. I, I don't know. I'm not sure what I what I would be looking for in features. I know multicolor seems to be a consideration. The type of filament seems to be a consideration. Uh, even the, I guess, the, uh, how fine it's able to print. Um, I, I'm, I'm probably in the three to eight hundred dollar range, but maybe if I was convinced the features were were going to be, you know, useful, I'd probably go a little bit higher. So I'm just kind of, like I said, I know I want to get one. I just am not. I'm not entirely. It's a very very confusing technology when you. Well, yeah, you uh, know, you, the case could be made that uh, 3D printing was something Silicon Valley decided was going to be the next big thing, and then it wasn't. So uh, <laughs> it's a hobbyist thing, and it's very uh, early days yet. Most of what you could do with a 3D printer is fun. 
people often talk about, well, I could print parts. You know, when my uh, my uh, knobs on my uh, oven break, I can print a new knob. Yeah, I guess. It, have you played with 3D printers at all? My suggestion would be before you spend even a few hundred dollars on one that you go to a maker space or somewhere around you and, uh, you know, try it and look at it. And, and honestly, talk to somebody who uses them because there are definitely... Uh, a lot of gotchas in the 3D printer space. Now, if you just want to learn about printers, 3D printers, uh, there are a couple of good uh, choices. I would say um, the one that uh, the wire cutter recommends is probably the best, which is the Tier Time Up Mini. It's right in your price range. It's $529. Um, it uses filament, uh, so it's going to make you know plastic stuff. Um, it's it, one of the things that's really uh, a challenge with lower price 3D printers is there's is a lot of calibration involved, um, and uh, you have to calibrate often in between prints. Uh, the more expensive printers are a little bit better. They also can work with different materials. Uh, almost all of these will uh, less expensive ones will work with PLA, a plastic. Uh, the other one that uh, I think the uh, Father Robert, our printer guy, likes, it's a little more expensive for 1200 bucks. is the Lulzbot, L-U-L-Z-B-O-T. That's a slightly higher grade uh, printer. But I think uh, you, you'd do fine to go with the wire cutter's pick. $530 at Amazon, the Tier Time Up Mini 2, T-I-E-R-T-I-M-E. -E. They call it the best printer for beginners. And you get pretty quickly an idea of what it could do. I fear that what happens with a lot of these 3D printers is people get all excited about them. And they print something, and then there may be maybe two things, maybe even three, and then never again. Uh, how about how about in the chat room? How do you feel about uh, 3D printers? Uh, any of you still using them? Check out the. I would check out the makerspace first, the local library, before you run out and get one. Uh, and if you're going to get one as a gift, we have occasionally have people call in and say, "I want to get a 3D printer for my nephew or something." Uh, get, get them, get them out there and um, and and using one in a makerspace. You don't want to be a better gift for a kid who's motivated in that way. Is a subscription to the local makerspace. That's a place that has all sorts of tools, but more importantly, a lot of adults around who can show you how to use them safely, effectively. Uh, and the same goes for a 3D printer. Uh, it's it's good to get some experience under your belt before you run out, and then you'll then you'll have a better idea of what you might want to get. If you if you just if you don't have a makerspace nearby and you just I gotta have one, then this tier time's a pretty good choice. You, you know, it's six hundred bucks under six hundred bucks. If it ends up being a you know pink elephant, gray elephant, what do they call it? White elephant. If it's an elephant of some of any color, you haven't lost that much money. You know, uh, some really good 3D printers are thousands of dollars, and of course, the commercial grade ones are tens of thousands of dollars. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think this was a fad. I'll be honest with you. I don't think, I don't think it has legs. <laughs> uh, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. Give me a ring. Eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Uh, ask Leo. Line three is Jay in Providence, North Carolina. Hello, Jay. Hey, Leo, I'm having a situation. I'm helping my mother with uh, something on her checking account where her debit card numbers keep getting accessed and charged without her knowledge. Yikes. And I, yeah, and I disputed, uh, uh, that is, she disputed, I assisted her with the disputing of, in the case of one account number. It seemed like they knocked it out of the park. They changed the account number, uh, gave her back the money, and then somebody got access to the new debit card account number and when we disputed it this time not only did we not get the money back she not get the money back but they're trying to tell us that uh, everything is fine because they changed the debit card account number again and i can I, I realize there's a lot of other people i can complain to but i'm wondering what an effective uh route to take is since they don't seem to want to put me in touch with the it department what's the bank it is the north carolina state employees credit union hmm. A uh, smaller bank, maybe they have. It's in, Do you have any idea how this number keeps getting stolen? Um, no, I don't. That's the first thing I'd try to suss out because there's no point in replacing it again and again and again if it keeps getting stolen. A couple of ways it can get stolen. I mean, these do get stolen is people using them 
uh, you know, when you use them, uh, you know, if you go to a dinner and the way Tron takes the card and disappears and they could easily copy it in seconds, right? Um, so, and in general, I would not recommend using a debit card for this kind of stuff. Does she also have a credit card? She does, and uh, I think she's been doing uh, a lot more with the credit card. Yeah, she, the yeah, protections doing... are a little better on a credit card than they are on a debit card. For instance, you can't lose more than $50 on a credit card as long as you report it relatively promptly. Um, there are, you can lose more on a debit card. And, and apparently this credit union, <laughs> how much did she lose that second time when they wouldn't refund her? It was 80 bucks. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's wrong. That's wrong. They, they need to refund that. So I would, I would say the debit card, keep it in your possession. If somebody wants to, you know, use it somewhere where you 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 have it at all times if someone wants to take it use a credit card instead your protections are better uh and maybe find a bank if you're going to use a debit card find a bank that will stand behind its debit card a little better than that credit union um but i would also try, try to figure out why it's how it's getting stolen you know when does she use it online uh she only uses email and facebook as far as internet usage goes She's and not she not buying gets anything with it online Right. In fact, the the bulk of what she does with it is receive her retirement through it, oh, through direct deposit. Right. Well, that's fine. That's, you know, um, it's possible that somewhere she goes, a gas station, an ATM has this, what's called a skimmer. These are unfortunately very easy to install, difficult to detect, and they have the exact effect of stealing the ATM card information. Uh, I presume she has a pin associated with it. Make sure she keeps that pin active and you know changes it regularly. Uh, and then, yeah, be careful. Uh, somewhere she's using it may have a skimmer in installed. It. I've seen these all over the place. Gas stations very common. It's very easy to install one. I th I think if if it's happened more than once, that's what's likely going on. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, from Clark.com on uh, the dangers of debit cards and how to avoid fraud. Thank you, Foodie, in the chat room for that. We'll put a link in that in the show notes. That's a useful post. Are you? Very good uh, tip. Thank you. And I presume that's uh, Clark, uh, what's his name? <laughs> 12 places to never use a debit card. Pay at the pump, because of skimmers. Any online payment. At the supermarket, again, skim skimmers. At the car rental counter. <laughs> when booking advanced travel, when buying furniture and major appliances, are automatic and recurring bill payments. Oh, all right. See, I use a system called privacy.com which is, in effect, a virtual debit card. And the number changes. It's merchant, locked to a merchant, or I can lock it to one transaction only. I really like that. But it, it, it is essentially a debit card because it goes right to your bank account. Privacy.com. And that's I kind of have been using that for online and stuff like that because, for instance, uh, I have a privacy uh, uh, credit card that only works with Amazon. Anybody else uses it, it won't work. It'll be refused. Uh, when I'm going to, so for subscriptions and things like that, I just make a new, you know, I have a new one for everything. And you can pause the uh, subscription. You can close the card. Gives you a lot of, uh, and it costs nothing. They make their money because it's a credit card. So they get their credit card percentage from the merchant. Chris in Frisco, Texas. Hello, Chris. Hey, Leo. How are you? I'm great. Welcome. Hey. Well, here's my issue. I've got a dilemma, but it's a fun one. Um, I, I have a Sony credit card, and I, ga I gain points on my Sony credit card that I can spend on Sony products. Mm -hmm. And I've amassed a bunch over uh, the year or years, and I um, think I'm in the market for a camera. And so I'm sort of locked into a Sony product, uh, but I've heard you talk about the A7 Mark II. Oh, I love my A7s. Uh, I have all the A's. <laughs> Sony Alphas are yeah, great, yeah. They're getting some competition now. Nikon has finally put out a mirrorless line, the D7, the uh, 7, what are they, X7. So uh, so tell me what you're looking for. 
Well, that's the thing. Um, you know, I'm not I'm not a professional photographer or even I'm a, I'm a hobbyist. I have kids. And I take pictures of them. And so also on their site, they also have like the the, digital, the alphas, uh, I guess the RX 100. Yeah. Uh, Mark two, three. Yeah. And I'm wondering if I'm overbuying or should I just go for the more of the digital snapshot? <laughs> like I said, I just like taking snapshots. I love like, these Sony RX uh, 100s. They're really great. They are expensive. Uh, they are probably the best point and shoots out there. They just released the uh, RX 100 uh, Model Six, which is two. No, I'm sorry, twelve hundred dollars, which is an awful lot to pay for a point and shoot. Um, so yeah, I don't, and I don't know if I'd recommend that. I mean, the, the reason there's a market for it is there are a lot of pros who want something light they can just pop in their pocket instead of their big heavy professional camera, and this is pretty close to that. Um, this is a very nice, uh, very nice camera. I'll recommend something a little less expensive, though. What's what is your budget? Well, that's the thing. Uh, it, that's the fun part of it. Is my, I have Sony points that I've accrued to my. Oh, camera. it's not. It's not really an object. Uh, oh, it's, uh, sort of. Like it's paid for. <laughs> oh well, I'll tell you what. If uh, you're getting it for free, that RX100 is a mighty fine camera. You might look and see if they're selling. I'm sure they'll sell the Mark V for less. Now that the six is out, the Mark, if they still sell the Mark IV, any of the RX 100s are great. They get better every year, but the but even I have an RX 100 Model Two, I think, and it's fantastic. So, okay. if you do, you have to buy it from the Sony site to use the points. I guess you probably do. Yeah, yes, I'll redeem through the Sony site. That's yeah. Right. So look and we'll see what they're offering. Those. So you, in other words, you want to, you got to buy a Sony. Yes. Yeah. So um, I think that it's just which one. <laughs> yeah. Well. You know, it's funny because when you're spending that much on a point and shoot, it's you're getting so close to the price point where you could buy an A7, <laughs> but then you have to don't forget you got to get lenses, and it becomes a much more expensive well, hobby. I have the I already have the Alpha 100, the first. Oh, good. Generation. Those alphas are great. I have my lenses. Yeah. yeah. So you could use then you can get an Alpha A6000, uh, be about half the price of uh, of the. Uh, Model 100, and it has interchangeable lenses, right? And you already have some lenses. Okay. That's going to be a better okay. choice, absolutely. Okay. But if you want to spend 100 bucks, Sony also makes $100 point-and-shoots. And if you want to spend a little more, an A7R 2 which is what I use, uh, it's, it's, the set, it's the older version of the A7R. Um, that's about 2000 so it's a little bit more. Um, I think I think you've you, you've got an interesting conundrum. It really depends on yeah. how serious you are about photography. You already ha you've had an alpha and you have some alpha lenses. Yes, that's probably yeah, what I would generation. do. Yeah, I would look at what alphas they have. Uh, cool. The A six thousand. You think that six thousand? You think the six thousand is a good camera? That's a heck of a nice camera. That's bet. That is okay. probably better than the the uh, RX one hundred. That that helps. Yeah, it's okay. a little bigger, but you can change lenses. That makes a huge difference, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. By the way, um, I took uh, you and Chris Markworth's advice and I, I purchased the, the 50 millimeter prime or 50 uh, prime lens. And yeah. I love taking pictures that way. It's actually. Isn't that great? <laughs> Put that on the A6000. You got a nice little system there. That's 24 megapixels. Uh, that's actually the camera. I believe that's the camera I gave my son for his high school graduation. So it's a little dated now. They have a 6500, but the 6500 is more than twice as much. That's what Sony tends to do. They'll keep the previous edition around, and uh, and okay. you can save a lot that way. Do you have a Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Okay, so here's it's the same dilemma. On the site, you can also buy um, <laughs> gift cards. And I've got enough points again that I can buy. I can purchase a lot of gift cards. And my daughter is into digital art. Uh, she's about 12 years old, getting into it and loves it. And I have enough that I could buy gift cards and apply it toward uh, a, a, some type of device from Best Buy. And I'm thinking about uh, the newer iPad. Yeah. Uh, do you think the iPad's the best for digital yeah. art, or is there other yeah. other ones out there? And she's going to want to get an iPad Pro because that uh, supports the pencil. And for a digital right. artist, you don't want to paint with your finger. That's finger painting. You right. want to draw with a pencil. So beware, in a month, Apple's going to release new iPad Pros. Right. So if you could wait a little or get the, get, the, uh -huh. get the gift cards and say, Honey, if I were you, this would be a good test of her impulse control. I would wait till next month. But yeah, an iPad Pro, at the very least, the current iPad Pros will cost less because new ones come out. 
Uh, but iPad Pro is we put Procreate on there, which is an amazing drawing program. I've seen such great art uh, drawn on iPad Pro. In fact, I've seen some of it's done with fingers. So if you if you can't afford a Pro, you know you don't want to give her that much money because uh, Pros are a lot more expensive. You can get the 2017 or I guess it's 2018 iPad for 330 dollars, and she'll paint with a finger or a little stylus or a cheese, you know, a, a string cheese stick. And sure. still do great stuff, but if you can afford okay. it, the Pro is the way to go. Right, and, and the, the iPad's a better choice than like. Oh yeah, there's not even any. There's not even a close second. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I mean, you're a nice Thank dad. You Thanks. Have fun. You got a great artistic family. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Not sure uh, what any what the iPads will be, or frankly whether they'll come out next month or October. But I my guess best guess is there'll be two new iPad Pros with Face ID, uh, no physical fingerprint reader. They'll be out next month, and they'll cost what an iPad Pro currently costs, and then they may sell the old 10.5 and 12.9 iPad Pros for less. So either way, waiting a month is a good idea because you can. You know, decide how much you want to spend. Well, that's right. The 6th Gen can use the pencil. Of course. I forgot. There's nothing like drawing. And a 10 and a half inch is fine. There's nothing like drawing on the iPad. There's nothing even close. Not at that price point. I guess you could get a Surface. Still not as good, if, if, I, if you ask me. So there is some question about when Apple's event will be. We don't know. So anything I say will now be speculation. But if they're true to form, they'll have an event in just a few weeks, next month. And uh, my guess, usually what they do, they like to do them on a Tuesday if they can. Because they don't want to do it on a Monday because then people have to work over the weekend. But they don't want to do it too late in the week. Tuesday is a good day to release a new product. In fact, usually what they do is they announce the product on Tuesday, they make it available for order, pre-order on the Friday following, and then ship it 10 days or a week later. So here's, here's what the best guess based on history would be. Labor Day uh, this year is September 3rd, so they're not going to have it on the 4th. That's the Tuesday. So the following Tuesday, September 11th, September 11th, uh, is probably not an auspicious day to have a big deal event announcement. In fact, in 2012, the Apple event would have been on September 11th. And instead, they moved it to the following day, September 12th. Uh, I think that's probably what they'll do. If that's the case, then Apple's iPhone announcements will be September 12th. This is all speculation. <laughs> but that's the date I'm kind of circling on the calendar. Uh, and it does actually tie in. Now, I'm not sure you know why but it ties in there was a leak from a german phone company that said you'd be able to pre-order the new iphone uh the following friday september uh 14th so that would make sense now maybe they did the same calculation i just did and they said well it's probably on the 12th so we start selling them on the 14th and then there was another leak that you'd be able to take delivery on september 21st maybe again that leaks based on just backwards calculating but let's assume it's not those are three data points one is intelligent guessing and two come from industry leaks yeah all right september 12th let's say september 12th you'll be able to pre-order uh midnight september 14th and you'll be able to get a new iphone on september 21st it's good this is good to keep in mind you wouldn't want to buy an iphone today for instance right what will it be well this we know a little more about because as we get closer to the ship date we get leaks out of China where they're being made. You know, the places where they're being made, people smuggle them out. They take pictures. So it's hard to keep a phone secret once they're manufacturing it. Uh, the best guess is there'll be three new iPhones. A small LCD-based iPhone that'll be less expensive. One that's the same size as the current iPhone 10 that'll have an OLED screen. Basically, the next generation iPhone 10, the 10s, let's say. And there'll be a big one, a 6.4-inch. It'll look like the iPhone 10, but a much bigger screen. That'll be called the 10 Plus, let's say. Uh, so the iPhone, I don't know, plain, the iPhone 10s and the iPhone 10 Plus. Three different models, two OLEDs, 
all three will have face ID. That's going to be the wave of the future. No more fingerprint. Uh, they'll all come with a new version of iOS, iOS 12, which has some very nice features. I've been using it uh, in a pre-release version for some time, and I like it. It's very nice. Pretty stable, too, I'm happy to say. Much more so than iOS 11 was at this stage. I Now, here's the really big question, Mark. We haven't seen any really any leaks about new iPads. Well, there's one. In iOS 12, the next version of the iOS software... There are two icons for iPads that don't look anything like the iPads we currently have. There's no home button. There, there's very little frame bezel around the screen, and it looks like there's a notch for Face ID, and there's two of them. So that's the only data point we have is these icons that appear in iOS 12, but it makes people think, and it does kind of make sense, Apple will release two new iPads, iPad Pros with Face ID, no home screen, no home button, and no fingerprint reader, just and there'll be bigger screens because there's less frame. There's less bezel around the screen. Don't know what the price would be. Don't know anything at all except this is all guesses based on, you know, logic and these icons. They would probably both be iPad Pros, one 9.7 inches, one 12.9 inches. Except that either they'll be smaller than the current versions with the same size screen or they'll be the same size as the current versions with a bigger screen. Something's going to give there. Will they announce those at the same time, September 12th, uh, that they announced new iPhones? Well, experts are divided on that one. In the past, Apple has done that, and they've also had separate events in October. Incidentally, there's even another rumor that Apple will, at this event or sometime soon thereafter, announce new Macintoshes. A new what? Mac Mini? There hasn't been a new Mac Mini in years. A new pro-level Mac Mini. And these, by the way, these this leak comes from a very good source. Uh, Mark Gurman is notorious. He's now at Bloomberg for uh, having excellent sources inside of Apple. And a new 13-inch low-cost MacBook. Will it be a MacBook Air? I don't know. But it'll be like the MacBook Air, but with a better screen and a sub-$1,000 price. That's all we know. Will they announce that in September? Unknown. They could have a mega event in September. September 12th, where they take two hours and announce all sorts of new stuff. <laughs> or they could set, they could spread it out a little bit. You know, one, one school of thought is Apple doesn't want to distract people from its premier product, the iPhone. So the iPhone will have its own event, and then they'll announce the other stuff later. The other school of thought is, but yeah, but you've got everybody's attention during an iPhone launch. Why not announce it all at the same time and get the maximum press? The only thing I, I am sure of is it would be a mistake at this point to buy a new iPhone or iPad. Don't. <laughs> wait. You can wait. You can wait three weeks. <laughs> wait. In three weeks, we'll all we'll probably know. The other thing I know for sure is no one knows that Apple uh, is pretty good about keeping this stuff quiet. We don't have any leaks from Cupertino, I don't think. And more importantly, uh, they can change things. These, these, these things I just told you may be all exactly true today. And in two weeks, Apple might say, yeah, no, we're going to do it another day. Or it's not ready. We're going to do it later. Or it's not good enough. We're not going to release it at all. You just don't know. That's one of the beauties of being Apple. They can completely control the market. And now that these events are held on the Apple campus, that brand new spaceship uh, campus, the, the Ring they have their own special theater, the Steve Jobs Theater. And because it's theirs, they don't have to book it ahead of time. They don't have to telegraph to anybody what's going to be happening. And, and Apple's famous for not letting the press know until a week or so beforehand. So if it is the 12th, invitations will go out early September, and then you'll know. I can tell you one thing. It'll be the best iPhone ever. We know that for sure. <laughs> At least they'll tell us that. Are you going to buy a new iPhone? Or you know, most people I think wait, don't they? Uh, every other year, maybe, or every third or fourth year. The, a, a requirement of this job, a requirement I don't mind too much, is that I get the new iPhone every year. I have to pay for it. I don't get it free from Apple. I don't, even if I could, I wouldn't want it free from Apple. People who do get uh, review units of these devices return them after a couple of weeks. I don't think that's enough time to review a device. And I don't, you know, I don't want to be beholden to Apple. So I'll, you know, I'll just like everybody else, get up at midnight on September 14th, 
if that's the day. And keep hitting the refresh button on the Apple Store until I can get in. I'll probably get the uh, new iPads too, at least for review. I don't. This is an interesting thing. You, d d nobody feels the need really to upgrade an iPad unless they're really old. If you got your iPad in 2010, okay, maybe it's time for a new one. But if you have, as I do, a year or two old iPad, I love my iPad Pro, the 10.5 inch. It's what two years old now. That is a work of art, a beautiful thing, and there is absolutely no reason to buy a new one. I don't need a new one. And that's one of the reasons iPad sales tend not to be huge. I think they, I think they saturate the market. And then, every, you know, in four years, you might get a new one. 8888 asks, Leo, do you agree with my, uh, my careful calculations? If you work for Apple and you'd like to tell me something, we'll keep your identity secret. We can even use a voice changer on you. Give me a ring. 8888 ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. <laughs> Ain't no stopping us now. <laughs> Good. I'm glad where does, to hear it. Where, do they, where does he find all these records? Is there a, you know, I bet you, I bet you. Records? Records? <laughs> I bet you. No, I bet you he's playing records. I bet you in the back, somewhere out in the, the storage shed, somebody has stuck all the old disco records. What are you going to do? You're not going to throw them away. Maybe disco will come back. Yeah, well, don't you think someone digitized them and... Put them on a cart or something? Are they digitized? Maybe they are. It'd be very fancy. Yeah, put them on a cart. They're all on carts. <laughs> <laughs> so Dick joins us every week to talk about uh, some fun piece of consumer electronics he's found, sometimes on his doorstep, sometimes at a conference. What do you have for us this week? Yeah, all right. So, you know, every year I try and find an unusual backpack uh, for going back to school. I do a spot for ABC. So I actually found this in February at Toy Fair, and I said to the woman, I think it was uh, Josie Makata, she had backpacks that looked like giant football helmets. <laughs> Oh, I and need I said, this. My son is a big oh, Green Bay Packer fan. Oh my gosh! I said, I said, Jesse, uh, in August, can you send me one? Because yeah. I think this is really different. And so she started out with one, uh, Ohio State, and and it took her six years. From the time she came up with the idea, she was getting her son's backpack, and she thought, you know, this looks like a like a bag she said i'm going to come up with something really unique for kids and so she stumbled with the idea of making backpacks that look like giant football helmets they're 18 i think it's 18 and a half inches high and she started out with ohio state and over the six years she six signed up years well you got to license third, it right yes 30 schools, and they're still working with more schools. Oh, but also, no NFL. This is all NCAA. No, but they're, they're trying for and, – and then, of course, you had to design it, and then you have to have it built. I mean, it's – from the back, you hit it, and it, and it's a, 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 it's a helmet, hard surface. It's hard helmet surface? Yes. Wow. It's a hard – helmet surface wow. and then you open it up and there's there's two compartments one there's a, a slip-in compartment for a tablet or a laptop and then the back compartment is really big because it's the inside of that half football <laughs> helmet and they're they're very reasonable they're, they're 49.99 oh, she's gonna sell these like crazy but she has to I get think the nfl so. involved Yes. Also, Leo, if you want to just make your own, yeah. they sell different color combination helmets that are blank of, oh. of, decora of de decorations. Oh. oh, Leo, the Twit team. I need a the, Twit helmets. A Twit, <laughs> a Twit helmet. And it, and and the upside of this is somebody whacks you in the behind. They're going to hurt themselves. A exactly. It's a, a helmet. A yeah. Exactly. I, I thought it was very clever, and it has mesh pockets on the side for the water bottles. Oh, I like and this. I like yeah, it's this. very clever. So, it's very clever. Starsportsbackpack.com. Dot com. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think they might have something on uh, Amazon, but I'm not sure. Uh, but the, the company itself 
where you can see them all is what you said. And, Star and what's her Back. story? Is this is her first business? Is it? You know what? I believe it is. It was just something that she thought, you know what, my son, I'm going to do something that he will really stand out at school. And when, when other kids saw it, they, oh, I want that, I want that. And oh, then she thought, well, this. you know what? They I'm going to branch out. They have some hockey, LA Kings, Montreal Canadiens. So they've got NHL helmets as well. This is really yeah. cool. I think it's a very clever idea. I yeah. think she's onto something. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, yeah. Well, I wish her luck. I think that's great. And if you, uh, if you have an NCAA or a hockey team that you like, she's, you know, go and it, there's check it out. There's a generic, uh, 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 yeah, on there you can see the generic, where, what it looks like with no logo at all. Right. So you design right. your own. Pick a color. Pick a what's color. The, what's the official twit color, Leo? Uh, like every website in the world, baby blue. Baby blue. Okay. Well, not exactly baby blue. Twit blue, I would call it. Twit. Oh, twit blue. I like that better. <laughs> it's baby blue. <laughs> I could give you the Pantone numbers if you really cared. Uh, Dick Bartolo, you'll find him at gizwiz.biz. In fact, that's where you'll find the link to this helmet. G-I-Z-W-I-Z dot B-I-Z. Click the uh, Gizwiz Visits the Tech Guy button. To find, actually, you've got it on the front page, but you could click the Gizwiz Visits the Tech Guy button and you find all the stuff that he mentions on our show. Uh, he also is on World News Now and ABC on a regular basis, mentioned it there. You know, you'll find it all over the place. While you're there, play the What the Heck Is It contest. We're running, we're running up against the well, clock. Yeah, here. just like six more days. It ends, ends in August, August the 31st. It's pretty obvious. It's Yes, uh, what is it, Leo? Well, it's that light that the police put on the top of the car. You know, those undercover cops when they in the movie and they're they're driving around, they're eating their hoagies and all of a sudden they see a crime committed, they they whip it out from the glove compartment, slap it on the top of the car. It's that. That's not bad. That's it's not, not what bad. it is. Oh, I'm not saying. I'm no, just saying that's not bad. I know it's bad. not cuz that's so <laughs> obvious. It's definitely not. And one thing he doesn't give you is any size of a sense of scale. So we don't. Why? Yeah, no. No, I would never do that. So for all we know, that thing is a quarter inch tall. It could be teensy weensy, or five feet high, or it could be the size of the security robot patrolling our parking lot. Could be oh, either. I saw that guy. Yeah, yeah. That thing was five foot six. It was huge. Ah, <laughs> uh, okay. all right, Dick. Well. Uh, I'm going to play this game because we got to get. Well, I can't play, but others can play and win a chance to uh, get. Oh, you can play. Employee employers can play. Employers, not employees. That's not employ no employees. Employers of Dick D. Bartolo <laughs> and his family is encouraged. It, yes. Encour no, I have I have a good set of autograph Mad magazines. Thanks to you, I really okay, appreciate good. it. So yeah. I won't compete against everybody else. But you go over there and you get a chance to win an autograph Mad autograph by this guy. In fact, this is the Mad magazine with the whack a moles. Or whack yes. a holes on it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I love it. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. Hey, have a super trip, buddy. Thank you. Yeah, wait, the okay. good news is, so I'm I'm gonna be leaving because I don't wanna I I don't like being around when the Apple events happen. I don't want to. We have, Oh, you know, I I think they'll delay it until you come back. No, they think? no, they wait until I'm gone. Oh, See, is okay. he out of the country? Okay, now we can tell people. <laughs> So I so but what we're going to do is in fact if, if you're on the phone hang on because we will continue to record some calls after the show ends in then a couple of minutes. Uh, so I I like to make new shows. So the first couple of weeks there'll be brand new shows, brand new calls you haven't heard before. Then Rich Demuro will be here, and I know you love Rich. In fact, everybody likes Rich a little I, too I, much. I love Rich a little bit less than you. Oh, thank you, Rich. From uh, he's on KTLA. He's a good-looking television tech guy. I hate his guts. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I love Rich. He's going to be filling in for me the week after the Apple announcement. If we've calculated correctly, this is why this is actually a big deal, getting this Apple announcement timing right, because I am gone uh, through September 9th. He'll be here September 15th, 16th, 22nd, and 23rd. And with any luck, he'll be able to talk about the new Apple stuff. If not, I'll talk about it when I get back. Perfect. And we have pre-recorded Dick D. Bartolos you haven't heard. All sorts of great stuff. Don't worry. you All new content coming up. Thank you, Dickie D. Okay, buddy. Take See care. See you next month. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you to Michael Cozio, musical director. Thank you to Kim Schaeffer for answering the phones. If you're on the line, hang on the line. I'm going to keep answering calls. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Well, that's it for the Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. 
And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.